airbursts, and cratering impacts. A new journal. You are listening to Brothers of the Serpent Podcast. Welcome back, ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, angels and demons and monsters and serpents. This is Brothers of the Serpent Podcast, and we are coming to you not live from the 10 by 10 by 10 Tangent Cube of Science, Woo! where we are nestled amongst the dusty bones of an ancient seabed high atop the Everest Plateau, and they are not so dusty right now. It is uh, raining, has been raining all day, which is great in this area. Uh, so everything is very wet. Bone, bones aren't very dusty, they're just muddy. Sludgy bones. Finally. Finally. <laughs> River's full again. Yep. Or at least the creek. Yeah, the creeks are full. It would be excellent if the lake began to fill back up. That would be fantastic. <laughs> <laughs> Kyle has a uh, a beautiful... Uh, is this Tears of the Kingdom? Yeah, it's yes. a Tears of the Kingdom a giant mug. coffee mug. Soul got it for me. That's awesome. What I just started, a, What a guy. I just started this game. Oh, it's fantastic game. I have noticed the 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 that you start out in the Stone Age in these games. Yeah. It's like it's actually it's 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 just like the podcast. You start out with all this tech, all this gear, and then there's a catastrophe, and then you basically have to make a butt flap and run around with a stick. Like <laughs> every game starts this way. <laughs> well, folks, we've got the watcher in uh, in his tin can in outer space, with his, crawling out of his bag of chips just moments ago, waking up from a space nap, <laughs> and uh, I got his audio routed through the board finally. Oh, so, yeah. how you doing, buddy? Doing well, yeah. And a uh, little bit of drizzle down at the base of the plateau, also, mm. which is nice. Ah, little, yeah, yeah. little south, little rain for the whole region, and it's it's a good thing. Yeah, it's been it a is long, good hot, dry <laughs> summer. What the hell? Are we Tuesday talking about the, the weather, Watcher? <laughs> it's been a long time. No, nah, well, you know, I mean, I see these things from space yeah, and underground. He's up there in space. In secret. He's like, wow, there Places. is a <laughs> dot of cloud right over, <laughs> right over the plateau. <laughs> but no, definitely good to be back. And uh, always excited for an episode that kind of tends more towards the... Uh, the traditional we'll make it up as we go along yeah. sort of <laughs> this is definitely what we're doing sort of thread yeah. so uh, i always dig those i do too i do too we have a serious plan though we do but you never know the plan is to make it up as we go along <laughs> it's a very serious plan <laughs> <laughs> also uh i wanted to give a shout out on the show to uh this wandering wolf productions uh this guy's up in Austin, mm. nearby us, and he was just saying recently on Twitter, he was like, I need to get out to, to those cart ruts out there. And I'm like, we have been wanting to go to those too, so maybe we can set up a meetup with him. Oh, that'd be cool. Yeah. So yeah, shout out to you, buddy. And uh, we do need to do that. He said in the next couple of weeks, if we can make it, okay. we can just head up there, sure. go to those cart ruts in Austin. Finally, they're practically in our backyard. What are we doing? We should do we, it. <laughs> we have been slacking, yeah. folks. We yeah. are... Not doing our jobs. Yeah. So we need to get up there and do it. Um, so the other thing that's happening. Unacceptable. <laughs> it is. It's totally unacceptable. <laughs> Somebody has to chide us. I'll do it. Okay. Good. So <clears throat> Watcher's got to land. He's what the he have to parachute down in his module. And yeah. Splash into the Medina he Lake. Can... <laughs> Puddle. Well, he could splash down in, in Canyon Lake because it's closer to the oh, car okay, ruts. We okay. can pick him up there. All right. <laughs> so uh plans for this so what we want to do this show number one and i'm sure a bunch of you saw this is a paper came out from danny hillman I'm not sure about his last name not to not to would uh not not to Wijaja. yeah danny hillman uh about gunung padang so we are going to discuss that for sure the other thing we've been wanting to discuss we've been meaning to do this for a while and we're going to get to that this show is the five, it's five now, three, five, five, <laughs> five, five so. three papers, <laughs> five papers from the Comet Research Group. Uh, so we're going to go through uh, George's excellent article on it, on, on what's going on on the Cosmic Tusk. And then we're going to go through the, the uh, abstracts and some of the details of these papers because it's really cool what they're putting together here. 
Uh, but right. first, let us start with Danny Hillman's paper. Oh. Did you want to do Space Weather News? <laughs> Old habits die hard. <laughs> I mean, you cued the sound effect. Let's do it. <laughs> Space Weather News, <laughs> ladies and gentlemen, making it up we, as we go. We Space about the weather already. <laughs> Earth directed CME today. Coronagraphs so on board the Solar Heli and uh, Heliospheric Observatory detected a halo CME leaving the sun. It is heading straight for Earth. NOAA and NASA models agree that this CME should arrive in the late hours of November 11th, bringing a chance of G2 class geomagnetic storms. Uh, I kind of wanted to go back because there was a massive aurora that came all the way down. Like mm. people were seeing it pretty far south. Uh, of course, it's not going to be in today's news on spaceweather.com. Let's see if I can back it up a little bit and find something about that. Uh, let's see if I make a guess. Mm, nope. Nope. Okay. Ooh. That's okay. So no mistakes. This uh this actually this is interesting. This lets me go into the future. I could pick November 23rd. Wonder if there will be anything for November 23rd. <laughs> no, it's just the same page. Okay, for 10th. <laughs> so, okay. So, current conditions, solar wind speed 487.6 kilometers per second, density is 6.85 protons per cubic centimeter. Current sunspot number is 92. It's gone down a bit. Uh and the Neutron count is negative 5.4%, which is very low. Uh, and the KP index is 3, which is quiet. 24-hour max was 3.33, <laughs> which is the upper end of the quiet range. And uh, that's the space weather news for the week. Now, right. back to what I was originally planning to do. Not to Wajaya. <laughs> Not to Wajaya, says the watcher. Okay. All right, so... The title of the paper is Geoarchaeological Prospecting Prospecting of Gunung Padang Buried Prehistoric Pyramid in West Java, Indonesia. I will link this paper in the show notes. Uh, the abstract says, The multidisciplinary study of Gunung Padang has revealed compelling evidence of a complex and sophisticated megalithic site. Correlations between rock stratifications observed through surface exposures, trenching, and core logs combined with ground-penetrating radar, uh, ERT layers, and seismic tomograms demonstrate the presence of multi-layer construction spanning approximately 20 to 30 meters. Notably, a high resistive anomaly in electric, electric resistivity tomography aligns with a low-velocity anomaly detected in seismic tomography, indicating the existence of hidden cavity, cavities or chambers within the site. So high res resistivity is uh, connected to low um, low velocity. velocity, right? So if it's Mechanical. an open chamber, yeah. the air, air is, is high, resi is high, high resistive, resistive, and the the, low the sound is... waves would be traveling much slower through the less dense air than yeah. than the rocks. Right. Got it. Cool. Makes sense. Yes. Additionally, drilling operations revealed significant water loss further supporting the presence of underground spaces. Uh, so we'll get into that further, but basically I think what it means is they, they're they using water pressure to keep the drill cool or mm -hmm. they're just cycling it, right? And then suddenly they, the drill punched into an area where it was no longer bringing up core material, and then they just started losing water mm -hmm. instead of it being cycled Dang back it, up. I hope there's not books in there. <laughs> they just yes, soaked they, all the books. They lost a lot of water, yeah. 30,000 liters, I think, they pumped into there before they quit. Uh, ah! Yeah. Why would you do this? <laughs> Hopefully the books are made of gold. Hey. Yeah. Or emerald, you know. Could be emerald tablets. Mm. Uh, all right. So, uh, radiocarbon dating of organic soils from the structures uncovered multiple construction stages dating back thousands of years BCE with the initial phase dating to the Paleolithic era. These findings offer valuable insights into the construction history of Gunung Padang, shedding light on the engineering capabilities of ancient civilizations during the Paleolithic era. Wait a minute. I wonder if this water loss is because... Is it... Is it... I know this is way out there, but did they literally, like, punch into a void? That's... Yeah, that's the, the indication. We'll get to or that. Or is it just that 
the water they're using is escaping through cracks and other things that are in the construction itself. And Could just be that also. Down but through. they said that it stopped bringing material up, mm. implying it was a void. Like the core, they were taking core samples, and then suddenly it just punches through into an area where no more material is being mm -hmm. cored, and then they start losing water. Yeah. We'll get to that. Uh, we'll get to that later, to quote uh, Marty. Uh, okay, so introduction. Gunung Padang, located in Sianjur District in West Java Province, Indonesia, has been the subject of comprehensive archaeological, geological, and geophysical studies. Early descriptions described it as an ancient cemetery on top of a mound, but further investigations did not take place until local reports <laughs> prompted government attention in 1979. The name Gunung Padang translates to Mountain of Enlightenment in the local language. That's awesome. And it has been used for religious rituals throughout history. Of course it has. The National Archaeological Institute conducted studies that led to the site's restoration in 1985. So there was a restoration. And in 1998, Gunung Padang was designated a provincial-level cultural heritage site. Previous studies regarded it as a significantly large megalithic site consisting of stone terraces, known as Pundin Berundak, which are common in Indonesia but not on the same scale as Gunung Padang. Further archaeological studies were carried out until 2005, including limited excavation pits that reached less than a meter deep. While lacking radiocarbon dating, it was assumed that Gunung Padang was a prehistoric site built between several hundred and a couple of thousand years BCE following regional megalithic cultures in Asia. Situated in the southern mountain ranges of West Java near the headwater of the Simandri, Simandiri River, Gunung Padang is surrounded by other megalithic sites such as Kunjang 1 and 2, uh, Senkuk, Arkadomas, and Lek, I can't even say these, Step Pyramids. The site is located within Myopliocene volcanic rocks, comprising pyroclastic, epiclastic, basaltic, andesite lava, and intrusive, intrusive stones. To the north, the mountainous ter terrain consists primarily of quaternary volcanic products from active volcanoes. The presence of the active fault zone near the site poses earthquake hazards to the region. Okay. So they go through the, the field survey. Uh, the field survey of Gunung Padang began in October 2011 and continued until October 2014, comprising multiple seasons. The survey encompassed detailed mapping, geological and archaeological observations, shallow geophysical surveys, excavation trenches, and core drillings. It is one of the most extensive and integrated archaeological, geological, and geophysical studies conducted on a buried ancient structure. The studies indicated that Gunung Padang is not merely a simple prehistoric stone terrace, but a complex underground construction with substantial chambers and cavities. Carbon dating analysis indicates that it may have been constructed during the last glacial period in the Paleolithic era with subsequent modifications during the Holocene or Neolithic. The early publications of these findings in mass media outlets along with public lectures and conferences has garnered significant attention and popularity nationally and globally. Consequently, the Ministry of Education and Culture issued dec a decree in 2014 elevating the site's status from provincial to a national heritage. The strength and significance of this study lie in the comprehensive and integrated use of multiple techniques to explore the buried and expansive ancient structures of Gunung Padang. Okay, so they go through the methods here. There's a whole bunch of data and information, but they did uh, geoarchaeological trenching. So basically they chose very carefully. So the, the, the site is a bunch of terraces, and they lay this all out. They give you maps, um, but it's multiple sets of terraces. And the top part of it is covered in, basically covered in, uh, columnar basalt. Columnar basalt that's that they're saying is basically around four thousand years old. What do you mean four thousand years old? The construction is four thousand years old. Yes. Okay. Yeah, and you know it's columnar basalt itself uh, is a natural formation, but it always, almost always, forms vertically and interconnected and the way that this site is built it's obvious that somebody took, like lincoln logs yes that yeah. somebody took a bunch of these pieces and they cut them okay mm -hmm. that's the part that a lot of people ignore they've been cut into bricks yeah you know that have an average length of like like one meter ish okay and they've laid them all around the site and uh, lots of them are laid down on their sides mm -hmm. and they 
Some of them, a lot of them have mortar in there. <clears throat> but below that, so we'll get into this. So they, so they did the geoarchaeological trenching, which is because all this stuff is at the top and it's now a national heritage site, and even before that was a provincial heritage site, they're not allowed to disturb anything. Mm-hmm. So they had to very carefully, like, where are you going to drill? Where are you going to dig a trench? You know, so they had to find places on the terraces where there was no obvious, uh, there would be no obvious destruction of any archaeological stuff mm-hmm. if they dug here. And then they started digging trenches, and some of them got really deep. They dug nine meters in some cases. And they're going down the side of a wall that's constructed of yeah. this stuff for nine meters. Yeah. Yeah, so this place is, it's it's like... Like jungle, right? I mean, there's yeah, there's extremely tall trees around. Yeah, but this thing is really high, so it sticks up out of the tops of the trees. Yes, sort of, and, and it it's is covered it is, in vegetation. It is uh, <clears throat> surround a river splits or water goes oh. all the way around the entire base, so it is basically like a little island. Yeah, that's that's or a large island in a small river, right? Every time I see a river split and go back together, I look for pyramids. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> what Sagmatar? Sagmatar. That's what I deal. thought of when I when a I read giant that. Hill. Yeah, that's actually a pyramid. Right. Yeah, that's cool. Okay, so this, he says that the geoarchaeological trenching activities at Gunung Padang aimed to understand better the vertical profile and lateral extensions of the buried structures near the surface. The selection of trenching sites was based on the interpretations derived from the preceding geophysical surveys. The trenching operations commenced mid 2012, with most work conducted in 2014. Trenches size varied. Anyway, the trenches were manually dug using various tools, including spades and hose. The trenches were carefully backfilled upon completing the excavations and measures were taken to prevent erosion by replanting the surfaces. I I just want to point out that I think he's putting that in there specifically because he was accused, him and his team were accused of destroying the site, right, by other people in the, in the, archaeological institutes of, of their government somewhere. I don't know exactly. I don't know the, how it all works, but there were people, well-known people that were like, I haven't been to the site, but I've seen pictures, and they're destroying it, right? And what they meant was they're destroying the top layer, yeah. which is, you know, and they were like, they're causing horrible erosion, whatever. And he's like, no, no, we reburied them very carefully, planted stuff to keep it from, yeah. you know. Uh, so core drilling was also done. Core drilling activities were undertaken to explore the deeper rock layers, for this purpose, we employed... Okay, they list off the equipment. The collected rock cores were subjected to petrological and petrographic analysis to gain insights into their composition and characteristics. Additionally, the drilling operations allowed us to delineate the interface between the rock formations and groundwater, providing valuable information about the hydrological aspects of the site, which there are some mysteries about it, but another thing is that there seems to be a deep spring way down below and some of the stone from the deepest parts seems to have been put in place specifically to leach that water up from this spring. It's interesting. Mm. Uh, organic soil samples were carefully extracted from the spaces between rock fragments, which were subsequently used to carbon date uh, for carbon dating analysis. In specifically targeted locations, drilling activities aimed to explore suspected large underground cavities. These drilling operations were executed carefully and cautiously to ensure that no megalithic stones exposed on the surface were disturbed or removed. Suitable open spaces were selected for drilling, and customized wooden constructions were utilized as foundations for the drilling equipment. So again, he's defending their work there. We didn't destroy anything. We were very careful. I don't know. I'm, 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 I'm disturbed <laughs> by this 8,000 gallons of water that... Yeah. down into a hole. So. Yeah, we'll get to that. I hope we're getting to that. Yeah. <laughs> Radiocarbon analysis. <laughs> this study represents the first comprehensive analysis of C14 dating at this site. Organic soil samples obtained from the drill cores and the trenching walls were meticulously selected. They, the samples were believed to contain traces of bioorganic activities during and after construction phases. However, it is essential to consider potential sources of contamination. He kind of goes through how they uh, corrected for that. Additionally, any remaining carbons derived from modern vegetation were separated and thoroughly cleaned during laboratory processing, and most samples were analyzed using the accelerator mass spectrometry dating method from an analytical lab in Florida. Uh, Okay. Geophysical prospecting. The application of high-resolution, shallow geophysical methods in archaeological studies has grown significantly over the past two decades. However, the extensive use of geophysical prospecting to investigate buried and expansive ancient structures, particularly pyramids, remains uncommon. 
geophysical surveys that combine extensive excavations and core drillings to validate and refine interpretations of the imaged geophysical features are relatively rare. Most archaeological prospecting efforts have focused on uncovering smaller buried structures or features ranging from tens of centimeters to several meters in scale, such as tombs. So they're basically saying they broke new ground, they <clears throat> explored this vast structure using something that is usually done on small things, mm -hmm. and they just spent a lot of time working on it. That's, that's really cool. Yeah. Uh, this study offers a unique and comprehensive approach to explore hidden complexities of the site. This pioneering methodology provides valuable insights into the nature and construction of the structures, surpassing the limitations of traditional archaeological prospecting techniques focused on more minor features. Uh, ground penetrating radar. They, they list the equipment they used. They talk about the field conditions that pose limitations. You can't like run these things easily over the of course, because yeah. of all the stuff that's on top. Um, then they talk about what frequencies, and it turns out that the 40 megahertz frequency provided the optimal balance between resolution and depth penetration, reaching depths of up to 30 meters. Uh, the 15 megahertz frequency did not achieve significant depth penetration on the site, uh, and it was too low res, and the 80 megahertz frequency did not yield improving imaging, leading us to solely present the outcomes obtained with the MLF, MLF 40 megahertz antenna. Uh, so then they talk about how they offset stuff, their methods for analyzing everything. Uh, then they did ERT, which is the... Well, let me make sure I get this right. It Electro -resistivity. is electrical resistivity tomography. Uh, this data played a crucial role, offering <clears throat> valuable insights into the subsurface structures. ERT surveys provide flexibility in terms of target resolution, coverage, and desired depth of penetration by adjusting the electrode spacing. This method can be conducted in various field conditions, including high slopes and areas with dense vegetation. So they have to go and clear a whole bunch of stuff to do it, like you would have to with GPR. Uh, the spacing directly affects the resolution and penetration depth. Wider electrode spacings yield greater depth penetration but sacrifice spatial resolution. The penetration depth is approximately 10 times the spacing for the 56 electrode cable and 15 times the spacing for the 112 electrode cable. Moreover, the penetration depth increases when surveying over convex surfaces. Uh, anyway, so they they talk, They did a bunch of surveys using this method. Uh, then they did ST. So what is... Let me look that up. I thought I had it pulled up here. It's, I think it's just seismic reflectivity. Well, let me make sure. ST survey. South Texas surveying? No, that's not it. <clears throat> I'm pretty sure what by is his... an ST survey watcher. Yeah, I'm What's pretty sure deal? by his description. Um, slacking on the job over there. This is uh, hey. <laughs> is the watcher there? <laughs> I'm pretty sure this is the kind where you basically you have you you introduce sound waves into the ground or yeah yeah. So yeah, they put a yeah firecrackers and sledgehammers were yeah. utilized as seismic sources. There you go. Yeah. Uh, they're positioned in the middle of each receiver, fired at five meter, five minute intervals. Data continuously downloaded to a hard disk of portable PC, portable PC while repositioning the shot point. This configuration allowed for high resolution ST with deep penetration. The topography of Gunung Padang, resembling an uh, inverted boat, facilitated line configurations that covered the targets at sufficient aperture angle. Okay. Anyway, uh, they. That's what we got to do. What? We could we could do that like we had talked about you know with with GMA yeah about building a, a <clears throat> ground penetrating radar yeah but yeah we could definitely do the yeah get the shotgun shell in the yeah. tube or whatever and put it <laughs> <Yes>. down and <laughs> <laughs> yeah exactly <laughs> yep we just need the uh, <clears throat> the receiver <clears throat> and however you turn that into a visible yeah, yeah he's actually saying he was actually saying here listing the equipment. We got to look it up. He lists Let's the equipment, and he says that a lot of times the way that they analyze the data was using the analyzer that comes with the, the stuff that they got. So yeah. it comes with it, yeah. Yeah, we got to have one of those. Yeah. Okay, so results. The landscape of Gunung Padang reveals an isolated and elongated hill oriented north-south with symmetrical and flat east and west flanks. The hilltop is characterized by a flat, truncated surface adorned with stone terraces embellished with standing stones. 
This majestic amphitheater-like structure faces northward, offering a captivating view of an active volcano complex. <laughs> Water streams encircle the perimeter of the mound, and they eventually merge with the river. Uh, the surrounding higher mountainous ridges exhibit advanced erosions, resulting in rough terrains with streams eroding the slopes. This terrain landscape, characterized by intense erosion, is typical of the region's tertiary rock terrain. In contrast, the upper half of Gunung Padang displays a remarkable smooth surface, indicating a much lesser degree or a lesser degree of erosion. This observation provides an initial clue that Gunung Padang is more recent, a more recent feature than the surrounding landscapes. Uh, the megalithic site consists of stone terraces cascading northward, occupying the elongated flat top of the hill, which rises approximately 200 meters above the main river in the north and around 100 meters above the entrance gate in the parking lot where a stone stairway leads to the top. The site comprises five substantial rectangular stone terraces named T1, 2, 3, 4, and 5 from north to south. These megalithic stones primarily consist of naturally formed basaltic andesite columnar joint rocks, resulting from the cooling of hot igneous liquid under specific temperatures and pressure conditions. Then he lists the uh, terrace sizes 30 by 40 meters, uh, 20 by 25 meters, so they're big. Uh, the exteriors and interiors of the terraces are adorned with alignments of rock walls and rows of standing columnar rocks forming intricate spatial patterns and geometries. In 2014, the vegetation on the east slope was cleared to reveal these terraces. However, they have since become heavily vegetated once again. Pyroclastic and epiclastic rocks predominantly occupy the lower part of the hill. Okay. Let me skip down here. Um, he <clears throat> compares it to a couple of places. This is interesting right here. A comparative example of stone terraces is Labak Sibidug, a stepped pyramid close to Gunung Padding, which shares a similar size in antiquity but has not been extensively studied. Another example he gives in central Java, stone terraces constructions can be found worldwide, such as Machu Picchu in Peru, built by the Inca civilization, and Nan Maidal a megalithic complex on Pompeii Island in Micronesia, which utilizes similar columnar joint rocks. And this is weird. Interestingly, based on oral traditions, the Sadilur dynasty, newcomers to Pompeii Island, is believed to have constructed Nan Maidal. The pronunciation of Sadilur is remarkably similar to the Sundanese word Sadilur, meaning one family in the local language of West Java which is significant considering Gunung Panang's location. Hmm. This is an interesting is, little yeah. strange tidbit <laughs> there. Uh, okay. Multi-phase construction and hidden layers. The visual observations at Gunung Panang reveal a complex construction history with evidence of multiple phases and diverse architectural styles. At the ground surface, known as Unit 1, so this is the top level, which you see on the, on the surface, the prominent megalithic stones exhibit a variety of arrangement techniques positioned on soils containing numerous andesite rock fragments. So Unit 1 comprises columnar rock arrangements of standing stones and ramps defining the spatial geometry and terrace spaces. Notably, interwoven columnar rocks form ascending stone steps from the lower levels while tall rock walls enclose it. Intriguingly, this study unveil unveils that Unit 1 stone terraces extend beyond the hilltop and are visible on the east slope and in other cleared areas. It has been confirmed that these terraces were not recently constructed by local inhabitants. Unfortunately, significant portions of these stone terraces on the hill slopes have not been preserved. So it was, it's bigger than, than the, just this one part as well, is what he's saying. Okay, below or beneath Unit 1 lies an older layer of columnar rocks displaying more sophisticated construction techniques. These are regularly cut rocks arranged like bricks in a building with fine-grained fillers or mortar between them. This layer, called here Unit 2, remains hidden in plain sight with some exposed parts. Exposed parts or exposed areas reveal various elements of Unit 2, including the stone wall ramp between T1 and T2, an altar-shaped rock mound situated in the middle of T1, which is referred to as mazigit, or meaning a place for praying, and diagonally oriented tiles of columnar rock spanning T2 and T3 in approximately a north, uh, northeast direction. Notably on T1, the top of Unit 2 lies just a few tens of centimeters beneath the ground surface. 
the interwoven columnar rocks beneath T1 and the ramp connecting T1 and T2 are aligned similarly. Okay, so they're basically what they're saying is the top level that we all can see is laid over top of a of a much more ancient uh, set of constructions, which they're calling Unit 2 here. And that Unit 2 construction is actually better, better built than the stuff on the very top. Mm-hmm. So I'm going to skip. He's got so many descriptions in here. Uh, so he goes through the results of the trenching. Um, but I just want to skip down to, I'm just going to skip all the way down to the conclusions at this point because there's just so much data. So let me skip at the bottom here. Uh, results of the carbon analysis. Results of the ERT survey. I'm trying to look for a... Um, Some pictures. Like a diagram of this. Uh, yeah. Okay, so conclusion. Gunung Padang is a multi-layered prehistoric pyramid. This study strongly suggests that Gunung Padang is not a natural hill, but a pyramid-like construction. The pyramid's core consists of meticulously sculpted massive andesite lava enveloped by layers of rock constructions, which are designated unit three, two, and one. The carbon dating analysis further supports the multi-layer construction's long history spanning successive periods. The oldest construction, unit four, likely originated as a natural lava hill before being sculpted and then architecturally enveloped during the last glacial period between 25,000 and 14,000 BCE. So 27,000 to 16,000 years ago. Afterward, Gunung Padang was abandoned by the first builders for thousands of years, leading to significant weathering. Around 7,900 to 6,100 BCE, Unit 3 was deliberately buried with substantial soil fills. Hmm. Approximately a millennium later, between 6,000 and 5,500 BCE, a subsequent builder arrived at Gunung Padang and constructed Unit 2. Lastly, the final builder arrived between 2,000 and 1,100 BCE and constructed Unit 1. It is intriguing to note that during the construction of Unit 1, Unit 2 likely remained relatively intact and well-preserved. However, in a peculiar turn of events, Unit 2 was subsequently buried, possibly to conceal its true identity for preservation mm. purposes. As a result, Unit 2 now lies concealed <clears throat> beneath Unit 1, which comprises simple, superficial stone terraces representing the latest visible man manifestation of Gunung Padang. Concluding remarks and further studies, this study sheds light on advanced masonry skills dating back to the last glacial period. This finding challenges the conventional belief that human civilization and the development of advanced construction techniques emerged only during the warm period of the early Holocene or the beginning of the Neolithic with the advent of agriculture approximately 11,000 years ago. However, evidence from Gunung Padang and other sites such as Gobekli Tepe suggests that advanced construction practices were already present when agriculture had, perhaps, not yet been invented. The builders of Unit 3 and 2 at Gunung Padang must have had have possessed remarkable masonry capabilities, which do not align with the traditional hunter-gatherer cultures. The burial of these structures around 9,000 years ago adds further intrigue for reasons not fully understood. Given the long and continuous occupation of Gunung Padang, it is reasonable to speculate that this site held significant importance attracting ancient people to repeatedly occupy and modify it. To further advance our knowledge of Gunung Padang, it is essential for re future research to undertake comprehensive and systematic excavations that delve into the characteristics of Unit 2, 3, and 4, as well as their cultural significance. Employing advanced geophysical imaging techniques and directional drilling can prove instrumental in uh, including, sorry, can prove instrumental in exploring underground structures, including potential chambers. In the event of encountering a chamber during drilling operations, the use of downhole cameras can provide valuable visual documentation. Furthermore, conducting more extensive radiometric dating studies will contribute to obtaining precise age estimates for the construction, enhancing our understanding of the historical timelines. Gunung Panang stands as a remarkable testament, potentially being the oldest pyramid in the world, 
Further investigation and interdisciplinary research will uncover its hidden secrets and shed more light on the ancient civilizations that thrived in this enigmatic site. Okay, so that's their conclusions. Let me see if I can find the the details of the core drilling, because that's where they've got some very interesting stuff. Uh, ERT survey. GPR survey. Uh, carbon dating analysis. Sorry, I got to skip through this. <coughs> All good. Dude, there's a really interesting rock that I'm seeing here from Gudun Padang that has uh, features a lot like the strange features we've been looking at in like uh, the unfinished stuff. Oh. Um, it's got like these <coughs> these divots. Oh yeah, in the stone. Yeah, I was trying to find a larger image of it, but <coughs> look at this. Oh yeah, look at those scoops. Yeah, these scoop marks. Wow. There's a bunch of pictures of it. I'll see if I can find a better, higher resolution image. <coughs> okay, hidden layers. Sorry, I should have marked this where I found it. Uh. Okay, so they talk about the weathering. This so one of the one of the ways that they determined how long some of these so somebody would come and build like the idea is that somebody came and built something and then it sat there exposed for a long time. And so long that it that it it got very weathered, right? They call it spheroidal weathering. Um, but what's interesting is the very bottom layer, the bottom part of Unit Four, the stuff that was sculpted out of the ground, has very is they're saying it looks like new rock and it's sharp, right? Mm. So, okay, so are you talking about Terrace Four or because that's the top? No, he's calling it Unit Four, which is. They're basically unit saying four. the terraces that you see are just the most external part. Of, that's just unit one, all of that on the outside. Okay. Unit one is the outer covering of the whole thing. All right, let's look at this. There's five terraces, which this yes. picture is listing. So this is terrace one. Yeah, so he two, calls three, them T1, one. two, three, four, and five, right? But then he says that there are four stages of construction, unit one, two, three, four, uh, and five. Okay, gotcha. Yeah. So unit one is the lowest part of the construction? Unit one is what we see on the top. Up here. Unit two is what's right underneath that. Okay, gotcha. Unit three is deeper, and then unit four is the very beginning. Yeah, okay. Yeah. Uh, yeah, which is weird. So la like like the layers at Gubekli Tepe, mm -hmm. layer one is the top. Yes. And you get you know the yeah. older stuff as you go down, the number goes up. So what he's saying is layer four is comprised of somebody took an ancient lava, a hill of lava, and cut it into shape, and then immediately covered it in very large blocks. He says that they're, he doesn't say the size, but he just says they're massive andesite blocks, right? So the, the, the blocks that are covering it are heavily eroded, but the stuff underneath the blocks that has been cut into shape looks like new rock. You see what I'm saying? So this is very interesting. Like somebody came and carved this hill and then covered it. So the carved part, the foundation looks new. It's unweathered. But the stones that are sitting on top of it are very weathered because they sat there for 7,000 years right. or something. And then somebody came along and built unit three on top of this. Right. And then that sat there for 6,000 years or something <laughs> and got wow. heavily weathered. And then somebody came along and built unit two on top of that. And then later, somebody came along and built Unit 1 and covered up Unit 2. So there were, like, multiple purposeful burials of the previous structures. Yeah, or just, I mean, burial or a, just building on, you know, adding to it. Yeah. But I think he was saying that Unit 2, I mean, I'm sorry, Unit 3, which would be the second stage of construction, mm -hmm. Was purposefully buried because it looks like somebody dumped a bunch of like actual fill material on top of it and then built something on top of that, right? 
So it's it's interesting. I wonder if that fill material is actually just midden. It could be, yeah. Uh, I think I found a better picture of this. Eh, it's a stock photo that I'm not going to pay for. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, look at that. That is, yeah, that's yeah, interesting. That's pretty scoopy. Yeah, it is. Interesting. So I'm trying to find this section. Okay, results of core drillings. Man, we got to go here and, yeah. and really inspect because there's got to be more of this stuff. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Like if they were working the stone in the same manner. Yeah. <sighs> yeah. Man, that's cool. <clears throat> okay, so he said this. So results of core drillings. Unit one represents the topsoil or near surface soil, typically less than one meter thick, containing fragmented columnar basaltic andesite rocks, which is what we're looking at on the picture here. In GP2, GP4, and GP5 boreholes on Terrace 5, an ancient soil fill was discovered burying Unit 3 rocks beneath the topsoil. Unit 2, referred to as number 2, is easily identifiable as it can be seen both on the ground surface and in the trenches. It consists of columnar basaltic andesite rocks held together by a sandy silt mortar of anthropogenic origin. The individual cores of these rocks have smooth planar surfaces and typically measure between 20 and 30 centimeters in length, rep representing their typical diameter. At the base of Unit 2, there is a relatively thick layer of soil, occasionally containing loose gravelly sands. Unit 3, so this is the mm. second stage of construction. It's weird how this is listed out. But this is, Watcher's got the diagram here, but it's tiny. Yeah. The photo. No, I'll show it anyway, but... Oops. Wrong button. <laughs> <clears throat> yeah. So you can see unit four there at the bottom. That's why they're basically calling it a pyramid because of the shape of the original cutout. Then unit three is on top of that. It's pretty thick. And green. Yeah. Yeah. And then unit two is another fairly thick layer, but not as thick as the previous ones. And then unit one is the one on the very top, the surface that we see now. So he says here, Unit 4 is not exposed on the ground surface, and it consists of massive basaltic andesite blocks or rocks with intensive fractures. This characteristic was observed uh, in all the boreholes that they did. The rocks in Unit 4 are generally in a fresh state. They exhibit minimal weathering. The top of Unit 4 is identified by, a, but the top of the Unit 4 is identified by a heavily weathered, two meter high, massive basaltic andesite rock associated with fluctuations in groundwater levels, evident through water inflow during drilling. So there's something weird going on with that hmm. lowest level. Uh, okay, and where I'm trying to find where he talks about the water loss, right here. Okay, GP4 borehole contains crucial data regarding the suspected presence of a large cavity or chambers beneath the surface. During drilling, the penetration rate slowed down at a depth of 5 meters. At 7 meters, the drill encountered a blank zone with no core samples. At 8 meters, there was a sudden and significant water circulation loss exceeding 20,000 liters. After this point, the drilling penetration accelerated and maintained a high speed the water loss continued until the total unreturned water circulation reached approximately 32,000 liters or 32 cubic meters of water at a depth of 14 meters, which prompted us to halt the drilling. The substantial water loss strongly indicates the presence of a large underground cavity. So it's possible that it was a natural void in the, in the stone, you know, but it just needs to be investigated. You know, would would something like this, if it was a large uh, outcrop of basalt, could it have enormous natural cavities inside of it? Maybe. That's totally possible. Yeah. <clears throat> what is the actual... So the, so the actual bedrock is a lava formation, but it's not Lots columnar. of it, and there's a huge volcano nearby. But, it, but it's not columnar basalt. No. It's not. Doesn't seem like it would have a gigantic void in it unless it was a lava tube or something. Right, yeah. Or some kind of giant bubble in there. Yeah, maybe. Yeah. So anyway, it's very interesting. Uh I love the fact that they, you know, this is I don't think 
So when I first was seeing the headlines about this, you know, and then you read the paper, you think, okay, there's new evidence here. But this is all stuff that they did in 2014, from 2011 to 2014. This isn't new, specifically. Like, he hasn't been able to go and do new research yet. This is the same stuff that anyone who read Magicians of the Gods, we got a lot of this data in that. This is just all the details. So it's great that he's published this paper. But this isn't, this isn't new information, is what I'm trying to say. Okay. This is basically all the work that they did in 2011 to 2014. Uh, hopefully they can get out there and do new work now that this paper has been published. That would be great. But they were, I, as far as I know, they were his team was basically locked out of working on the site because there were, you know, there were complaints by other archaeologists in the area saying that he was destroying the top layer by doing his work. Hmm. So, yeah, I can see it's volcanic tough. Mm-hmm. Which uh, in Turkey is the that's what uh, the Cappadocia all those weird oh yeah like like uh, all the tunnels are dug through volcanic tuff I'm pretty sure it's it's kind of soft like good for tunneling into so yeah this is the the survey he also implies and there's like a tunnel chamber yes thing. he says that there there appears to be what looks like a, a long tunnel that they saw with the um, with the GPR and the ERT stuff so chambers were detected as well as tunnels but all of this is is buried under the top two layers but Very I just cool. found it I found it fascinating this concept that like 9,000 years ago, Somebody came along and buried the site. <laughs> he's saying, you know, he's distinguish- distinguishing in this paper between building another layer on top of it and specifically burying it on purpose. Yeah. Yeah. But that, I, I don't know. You're More... wondering if it's midden? Well, why not? I mean, if this place has been... Yes, you know people have been coming here for thousands of years doing ceremonies and stuff. Why wouldn't a um, Neolithic culture have occupied the site? Yeah, for thousands I w- of I years wish, and have it a giant midden up there. I wish I had the the info, but <clears throat> I think that midden is distinct is is pretty recognizable, right? And when I was I, reading through here, and he was talking, he was describing the material that it was buried, and it didn't sound like midden to me. Yeah, well, nobody ever said that about Quebecli Tepe either. That's true. You're right. That's all I'm saying. Yeah. It may not be. I'm just, I just wonder if it's like, well, was it thrown? Like, was it thrown there or did the midden build up and somebody like dug it up? Yeah. And it fell off the sides when they were uncovering the surface of one of the layers to start building? Yeah. Uh, who knows? I, I have no idea. So he says two distinct soil fills were encountered. The first type, referred to as ancient soil fills, uh, have a thickness of up to 7 meters and completely bury Unit 3, indicating no gradual in-situ weathering. The sharp contact between the soil fills and the top of Unit 3 suggests their human origin rather than natural soil formations. So that's confusing, because, like, does he mean... So human origin of the soils... Right, the natural I, soil. So that yes. So midden. is does that mean midden, or does he mean they brought it there and buried it on purpose? <laughs> right. Uh. GP five borehole revealed three different types of soils in the fills, further supporting their artificial nature. The second type of soil fill was found in terrace four, terrace three, and terrace two on the west side of the kilometer rock truncated line. The GP-1 borehole on Terrace 2 revealed that Unit 2 had been almost entirely excavated before the soil fills covered the remaining structures. So somebody, this is the other thing about ancient archaeology. Yeah. Somebody in very ancient times came along and dug all this stuff out. Yes. (laughs) Yeah. I mean, I'm like, if you're going to, if you go, if you find this place and you can see like megaliths sticking out of it and you're a builder culture yeah it's like okay well let's let's excavate this and build a temple on top of it yeah because this was an ancient like sacred site it's time to worship the old gods that's right (laughs) (laughs) so you would go and, and your team would excavate it and then maybe they built a structure there 
Yeah. Or just cleaned it off and tried to reconstruct it or something like that. I wonder if we can get this guy on the show. Oh, that'd be Wouldn't great. that be great? I would love oh, to talk to I'm going to have to go dude. back and delete the part where I was complaining about the <laughs> 8,000 gallons of water. <laughs> We can complain to his face. <laughs> How dare you? What if there are? What if this was the what is hall library? of records? You've dumped eight thousand gallons of water into a library that's been there for twenty thousand years. <laughs> I'm upset. <laughs> okay, we got to take a break. All right. Way long first segment. Yes. Yeah. We'll be right back. back ladies and gentlemen brothers of the serpent podcast went long on the first segment so uh we'll probably just do no one stopped me no it was great uh, we need we need to get through the whole kunun padding thing anyways yeah so. probably do two segments on these uh on these papers and maybe a patreon after that i don't know we'll figure yeah we'll for see. sure uh so comet research group kicks off a new journal and uh, the Cosmic Tusk has a blog post. Our uh, buddy uh, George Howard over there about this. I want to read that real quick, and then we'll go to the journal. But uh, this is from October third, twenty twenty three, on the CosmicTusk dot com. Comet Research Group kicks off new journal with blockbuster papers. The Comet Research Group published profoundly important new data this weekend concerning the Younger Dryas impact. A series of three papers were led by Dr. Andrew M. T. Moore, former president of the Archaeological Institute of America, concerning the catastrophe in the earliest Mesopotamia, and a single paper was led by Dr. Robert Hermes of Los Alamos Natural Lab uh, National Laboratory, comparing and contrasting the effects of the YD airburst and nuclear detonations. As many followers of the YDI hypothesis are aware, publishing information from the CRG concerning man's most significant episode has always been difficult. Some papers have required four years to pass the so-called peer review and be published, while others, once published, have sustained repeated baseless quote-unquote nuisance appeals for their retraction. Each of the new papers this week were subjected to a rigorous review from hostile academic cliques for years. To one degree or another, all 60-plus Comet Research Group publications since 2007 have navigated this challenging system with patience and respect. In the case of these more recent submissions, for, reason we can, for reasons we can only suspect, it had clearly become much more difficult due to the biased conduct of the editors and reviewers. Over time, it became clear that the effort required to publish in established but biased journals wasn't worth it, leading to the decision to start a new online journal that would be thoroughly peer-reviewed. That new journal is Airbursts and Cratering Impacts, and they have already issued Volume 1, which we're going to get to those papers in a minute. So George continues, when starting a new journal, the goal is readership, and CRG papers, when they are published, rank among the world's most popular scientific publications. That's what really pisses them yes, off. Yes, this is, this is really cool. A notable metric from the CRG is the number of downloads their papers receive. The Tel al Hammam paper is arguably the most read scientific article of popular interest in recent years, boasting 588,000 downloads. Many other CRG publications rank in the 99th percentile of readership. Wow. And then he shows a uh, little screenshot of... Uh, the metrics for yeah, the metrics. reading. Yeah. Um, the YDI subject is neither struggling nor obscure. Millions worldwide are interested in reading the primary material and data without the bias, delay, and intellectual manipulation typical of established journals in our time. Given this interest, the editors of the new journal believe readership will remain high, 
and the number of quality of publications can increase. This change benefits science, the public, and dedicated authors in the field, challenging the traditional establishment. The new journal could mark a significant shift in the future of peer review process. Uh, and he says, yeah, he just not, he's not going to embed downloadable PDFs like prior publications. Yeah, because he wants the hits. People directly to the journal. Yeah, yeah. which is great. So, uh, so, yeah, he has the, the bibliography. Um, so there will be archives of the, of the papers. They're still downloadable at the bib, but he's for, for these future papers, I'm assuming he's wanting people to go to the actual... Yeah, to the journal. To the journal itself. So the journal, uh, it's scienceopen.com, and it's the journal is called Airbursts and Cratering Impacts. And the... Uh, so, I, you know, you go to the site, the first page is kind of like a mission statement. And so I'll read that, too. It says, Our journal collection, Airbursts and Cratering Impacts, covers all aspects of impact events on Earth by comets and asteroids. It is open access, peer-reviewed, and multidisciplinary, and it encourages submissions on significant, cutting-edge, impact-related investigations that are broadly multi multidisciplinary, making them difficult to review, run counter to a prevailing view, are too novel to receive a fair review, or have been rejected by other journals. We support the philosophy that publishing scientific articles should be as simple and easy should be simple and easy for authors more importantly the significance and usefulness of new knowledge should be decided by many scientific experts rather than filtered through one editor and a few reviewers the publication of articles is frequently hindered by a peer review process that sometimes works well but far too often is seriously flawed Journal editors are frequently not knowledgeable about a manuscript's field of study, yet have the power to reject a manuscript unilaterally. Even more problematic, biased reviewers often act as gatekeepers to prevent novel discoveries from being published to the detriment of, this, of scientific progress. The flaws in the current journal publication system are having a highly detrimental effect on scientific research. A recent Nature News article from uh, February 4th, 2023, reported that paradigm-shifting disruptive science has experienced a massive decline of more than 90%. Wow. The article added that, quote, the number of science and technology research papers published has skyrocketed over the past few decades, but the proportion of publications that send a field in a new direction has plummeted, end quote. A flawed review process is one reason for this. We are helping to counter this trend by utilizing a multi-tier, multi-tiered peer review process with both single blind and open review components as follows. First, the article is internally reviewed by our expert editorial board members and guest editors. Second, the board will invite single blind reviewers to comment on the article. Previous reviews from submissions rejected by other journals are also considered and given the same weight as current reviews. Our commitment is to rarely reject submissions outright, but rather to work with authors through multiple revisions until a manuscript is acceptable for publication. Yeah. That's awesome. A lot of work. It is. That's great. Yeah. yeah. But, you know, if somebody... It just made me think of, like, if they have, like, a really great idea or a concept and and some some good work in there but there's like some flaws that you wouldn't want to yeah. pub, you know maybe yeah. some flaws in the process you want to be like hey here here's the problem can you can you uh, yes yeah, send me draft two like a regular work for on an actual this book. problem like yeah. there's a fallacy in here or something yeah. you know fix that yeah that's just cool yeah this assures that groundbreaking discoveries will be published rather than suppressed and are widely available to readers at no cost. Third, the article will undergo a non-anonymous post-publication review in which an article's quality and impact are judged by comments from the scientific community at large by its number of downloads and by its altmetric score and by its number of citations. Sounds good. Yep. But this, so this is the other thing. Like, I've seen this plenty of times, you know, when we're going through stuff that we review on this show. Uh, one of the classic skeptic attacks against 
some particular information will be like, oh, they had to make their own journal to publish the paper, right? Mm -hmm. that, and they'll just say that. Yeah. There's yeah. no discussing of the material in the paper. Mm -hmm. the, they're trying to imply that because this had to happen, the paper is not good. Science. No good. Yeah. I would like to point out uh, one other thing that, you know, George is helping to uh, to get done here with these guys because he's he's obviously worked closely with the Comet Research Group, part of them, essentially. Yeah. Uh, he's a co-author on the, the seminal 2007 paper. But... Uh, or the or the 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 younger dryas impact hypothesis, I should yeah. say. In any case, he's he's kind of working with them to to like as a request, like to people who create content or you know, like podcasters or whatever that, that he's in touch with, and he's in touch with a lot of them because of the cosmic summit and all that. Asking everybody, like, hey, will you share this stuff to your audiences because. This new journal, since they're sort of starting their new journal, they they want readership, and so it's a it's a sort of a bypassing the traditional media outlets for uh, gaining a, gaining readership as yes, well, and going absolutely. to the alternative media. So that's one of the we agreed. Uh, we're like hell yes, we'll we'll talk about these papers on the show and and get people to go. So definitely go check them out there. You know, even if you're uh, you're not familiar with reading scientific papers, like the the introductions, the 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 abstract, the introduction, and the conclusions, which is mostly what we're going to be talking about today, are are pretty easy to read. Yeah, and understand. Very accessible. And like, I mean, still, like when I was reading them before, I was looking up terms. Yeah, which is also great. Yeah, you know, stop, open new tab, look up this term, <laughs> look at the pictures of that rock. Yeah, <laughs> that they're talking about. It's great. So, I highly recommend you guys uh, check these papers out. There's some really fascinating stuff. Some of it's uh, very technical in nature, but there's some just really cool ideas and conclusions coming in uh, to this research. So, and it says right here. Five publications, 71,220 views already, which is yeah. great. And I'll put all the numbers up. I'll put the links in the show notes for sure. So if you're if you're listening to the show and you're on your mobile device or whatever, you can scroll down in the in the show notes and there will be links. You can go to the site, bookmark it, read them later. Uh, at least read the abstracts. The papers are fascinating. Yeah. All right. So we're doing the first one? Yeah. <clears throat> so uh, this one is titled Microstructures in Shocked Quartz Linking Nucle Nuclear Air Bursts and Meteorite Impacts. Yeah. Um, by Robert E. Hermes? I think mm -hmm. so, yeah. At all. But I mean, look, James Kennett's in here. These are the ones we're I'm familiar with. Ted Bunch, yep. Christopher Moore, Malcolm LeCompte. Um, uh, I don't recognize all these people. Alan West is in there. <clears throat> so yeah, this is this is pretty cool. They uh, you just want to read the whole abstract? You want me to read it? Sure. Many studies of hypervelocity impact craters have described the characteristics of quartz grains shock metamorphosed at high pressures of greater than 10 gigapascals. In contrast, few studies have investigated shock metamorphism at lower shock pressures. In this study, we test the hypothesis that low-pressure shock metamorphism occurs in near-surface nuclear air bursts and that this process shares essential characteristics with crater-forming impact events. To investigate low-grade shock uh, microstructures, we compared quartz grains from meteor crater to those from near-surface nuclear air bursts at the Alamogordo bombing range in New Mexico and Kazakhstan. This investigation utilized a comprehensive analytical suite of high-resolution techniques, including transmission electron mic microscopy and electron backscatter diffraction. Meteor Crater and the nuclear test sites all exhibit quartz grains with closely spaced sub-micron-wide fractures that appear to have formed at low shock pressures. Significantly, these microfractures are closely associated with Dauphine twins. You want to explain what that is? Yeah, so Dauphine twinning is um, when, 
like a quartz crystal like this <laughs> <laughs> is actually twinned it, it'll be it has like a sort of like a bilateral symmetry so this point here will be mirrored on the other side uh, or they can they can twin like this there's different types of twins so the same exact crystal will grow in one direction and then the other one is mirrored at a at, at like an, angle. an angle yeah um, but yeah they have uh, <clears throat> the way the bevels are at the where the crystal comes to a point will be a mirror image on the other side it's really interesting and they supposedly only form from like high pressure oh. uh, high temperature conditions that cause this twinning and for some reason I'm not sure but that's it's I can pull up some images of the yeah, Dauphine so the, twin. Yeah, so these microfractures are closely associated with Dauphine twins, and they are filled with amorphous silica, or glass, which is widely considered to be a classic indicator of shock metamorphism. I want to show you that real quick. Um, they got an image of it here. Okay. Uh, well, keep going. I'll find it. Okay. Thus, this study confirms that glass-filled shock fractures in quartz formed during near-surface nuclear airbursts, as well as crater-forming impact events. And by extension, it suggests that they may form in any near-surface cosmic airburst in which the shockwave is coupled to Earth's surface, as has been proposed. The robust, robust characterization of, of such events is crucial because of their potential catastrophic effects on the Earth's environmental and biotic systems. So the, I mean, the basic upshot is like they look, they looked at quartz from meteor crater and also from known nuclear test sites and found shocked quartz with this with very similar attributes, uh, basically showing that the same kind of shocked quartz that we associate with actual impact events like meteor crater that makes where something hits the ground and makes a big hole can be associated with energetic bursts up in the air where there is no actual impact or the Im the only impact is the shock wave basically right <clears throat> i'm not seeing the uh image i was thinking of but let's see um uh, yeah it's weird that there's this like this glass that will fill in these cracks in the shock quartz, and it's, uh, I don't know how else to say it. It's it's uh, anaerobic or anh, uh, yeah. It has no, yeah. It's it got a very low water content. Low oxygen. Low oxygen. Okay, content. yeah. Where was I reading low water content that there was that they were associating with high temperature as well? It's also low oxygen. You're right. Am I right? Anyways, I, I thought it said low water. <laughs> Maybe you're right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'll find it. But the the there was there's an image. Maybe it's in one of the other papers of the. You, there's a very clear band in the shock quartz that's the glass that fills in. Um, that's pretty cool. So yeah, the 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 upshot is that they're showing shock quartz in low pressure, like you know, relatively low pressure to to uh, actual Earth impacts. And since you have a known nuclear test site that had air bursts, essentially they're they're blowing up the nuclear bombs in the atmosphere. Yeah, they can they know that was an air burst, so they can go there and they can find shock quartz and compare them to a known impact site and show all the similarities to say, for example, at, uh, in, in the, in Abu Huraira, Huraya, that, uh, these, these shock quartz grains could be from air bursts, right? Yeah. It doesn't have to be an impact. Yes. Specifically. So that's, that's genius. I like that. Um, and yeah, we should just move on to the yes. Abu Huraya Syria part one. Okay. Go ahead. I'm gonna I'm gonna look for I'm gonna show these images. Okay. Syria part one. Abstract is a previous investigation revealed that shock fracturing 
a form of low-pressure shock metamorphism in quartz grains, can be produced during near-surface atomic airbursts and in cosmic, cosmic impact structures, most likely at pressures lower than 8 gigapascals. This discovery implies that similar shock fracturing may also form in quartz grains exposed to near-surface airbursts by comets and asteroids. Here we investigate this hypothesis by examining quartz grains in a sedimentary profile from Abu Huraira, a prehistoric archaeological site in northern Syria. This site was previously proposed to have experienced a nearby low-altitude cosmic airburst at the onset of the Younger Dryas, roughly 12,800 years ago. The Younger Dryas boundary layer at Abu Huraira has previously been shown to contain a rich assemblage of materials consistent in indicating a cosmic impact. These include anomalously high concentrations of melted microspherules, displaying increased remnant magnetism, melt glass with low water content indicative ah, of high temperature melting. You're right, it's low water content. Nanodiamonds, potentially including lonsdalite, carbon spherules produced by biomass burning, black carbon or soot, and total organic carbon and abnormally high-temperature melted refractory minerals and elements, including platinum, iridium, chromite, and zircon. To further test this impact hypothesis, we searched for evidence of shocked quartz, a robust, widely accepted indicator of cosmic impacts. We used a comprehensive analytical suite of high-resolution techniques, including transmission electron microscopy and electron backscatter diffraction to examine and characterize quartz grains from the YDB layer at Abu Huraira. Our analysis revealed the presence of quartz grains with subplanar, subparallel, and submicron wide intragranular fractures, most likely produced by mechanical and thermal shock or the combination of both. So, subplanar and subparallel being, meaning like they're sort of in parallel lines, but not quite. Mm -hmm. And subplanar, I, I'm assuming, means that, that if you follow that line through the rock, it would be like a plane. Yes. And then they're saying that the that they're filled with this melt glass yeah, so this by, is, through a process they call jetting, which they're implying is like there's like all this stuff is melted in the air and then it's getting shoved into these cracks oh my God, through the high crazy. pressure. Yeah. So yeah, in the in the images I'm showing here, you can see this black area. These this is where the silica uh, is they're calling it amorphous silica. Sometimes referred to also as glass. Glass. <laughs> uh, okay, here's here's the, the one right here. This Big band right here is glass. Oh, uh, yeah. In the shock court. So all that red is the little amorphous silica, but then there's just one big area that's filled in. That's really cool. Like it glued together those two pieces. <laughs> no, no, no. No. It was shoved in there. Oh, okay. Jetted. Yes, it was jetted in there. <laughs> okay, so yes. Furthermore, these fractures are typically filled with amorphous silicates or glass a classic indicator of shock metamorphism, elemental analyses of the weight percentages of oxygen in the amorphous silica indicate that this could not have formed from the deposition of hydrated silica, e.g. opal and hyalite, which is enhanced in oxygen. Instead, the silica we observed is typically depleted in oxygen, so you're also right. Okay. Consistent with melting under highly reducing conditions. That's what I was thinking, the reducing conditions. Of yeah. But it's also low in water. It is. We're both yeah. right. <laughs> <laughs> but I was actually more right than you were. I'm just saying. <laughs> Listen. <laughs> there is there's hydrogen and oxygen <laughs> in water. <laughs> so they both can be right. Uh, okay, so the silica we observed is typically depleted in oxygen. The shock fractures in quartz grains also display dauphine twinning, which sometimes develop develops during the stress of high temperatures and pressures. This evidence is consistent with the hypothesis that the glass-filled fractures in quartz grains were produced by thermal and mechanical shock during a near-surface cosmic airburst at Abu Huraira. These glass-filled fractures closely resemble those formed in near-surface atomic airbursts and crater-forming impact events. So I would just like to point out, and I'm sure no one at the Comet Research Group is going to like me saying this, <laughs> but... This also could be evidence of an ancient nuclear explosion. <laughs> yes, that's right. <laughs> I mean, maybe not. If there's all these metals, I, pr I would assume we're not finding platinum and iridium and stuff. 
at in Kazakhstan and in New Mexico, right? Mm. So maybe not. But it is interesting that we're comparing they're comparing this stuff to nuclear explosions and they're like, yeah, something came out of space. And I'm like, but uh, it could have been a bomb, you know, maybe. All right, so you're still Kyle's looking up I'm gonna, more photos. I'm gonna pull up the Dauphine twin. Okay. And I, I just I can't remember why I know what this is, but I was looking at these for some other reason. Oh, not a related long to this time ago. Oh. Yeah. Was and it about nucleation? It, I don't know. It might have been some crystal hippie stuff like, <laughs> oh, dude, you got to have the Dolphin twin. You know, like they, they probably find them very special. Oh, yeah. And they are right. They are. They are special. Uh, so I'll just pull up a, there's a little diagram here that's, it's, oh, my gosh, that is a very it's a tiny di- little <laughs> diagram. Well, I'll just pull up the, the, the image results because it's okay. going to give you a yeah. clear idea. Uh, So yeah, um, right there. That's okay. I see. Yeah, but you can see here with the, the way it's it's mirrored there. Even these little side bevels. Yeah, it's pretty cool. And then there's uh, different types. So this is the so, Japanese twin. Where it's like two going <laughs> at ninety degree calling. angles to each other. <laughs> Dauphin twin, Brazil twin. Um, That's a pretty good one on the Pinterest picture. You see it? An actual picture of quartz down there at the bottom. Here? Yeah. It's just busted. Wow. It's broken, but yeah. that's a twinning, right? Dauphin law twin says. Yeah. Twin must, by law. If the internet says it, it must that must be it. Oh, these are cool. Yeah. So this is caused by this kind of shocking that happens at these high-temperature events? Is that what they're saying? Or can it form in some other way? I think it's indicative of a high-temperature or high-pressure event or something like that from okay. what I r- remember reading. But uh, So let me see if that the, at the end of the paper here if there's conclusions. Do they have conclusions? Yeah. So this investigation is the first to have identified and described shock fractured quartz specific to the Younger Dryas boundary cosmic impact layer at the onset of the Younger Dryas climate episode in the Abu Herrera archaeological site, thus verifying this as a cosmic impact layer. Using multiple high-resolution analyses, we observed that some quartz grains in the YDB layer are similar to those that Hermes et al. reported for nuclear airbursts and meteor crater. These grains display fractures that, one, are either open or filled with amorphous silica glass, two, are commonly oriented in the same approximate direction, three, typically cross the entire quartz grain or subgrain, four, do not cross subgrain boundaries, five, range from near planar to curvilinear, curvilinear, and six, are commonly subparallel in orientation, seven, are often spaced less than a few microns apart. Eight, usually range from less than one micron thick down to a few nanometers, and nine are typically closely aligned with Dauphine twins. Most of these quartz grains appear to have been exposed to temperatures high enough to partially melt the entire grain, after which some portions remain amorphous while others recrystallized, sometimes as Dauphine twins in alignment with the fractures. Hmm. This evidence implies formation temperatures of greater than 1,713 degrees centigrade, which is quartz's melting point, and most likely at greater than 2,200 degrees centigrade, which is its boiling point. Multiple previous investigations have concluded that when amorphous silica is present within shock fractures, its presence allows for the unequivocal differentiation between impact-related shock fractures and the glass-free lamellae that mark slow strain tectonic deformation. We conclude that glass-filled fractures support the hypothesis that a near-surface airburst occurred near the Abu Huraira village. The shock wave from this low-altitude airburst coupled with the Earth's surface, producing extreme temperatures and pressures that fractured and melted quartz grains, melted or vaporized surficial sediments, and introduced molten silica into the fractures. 
Yeah, so uh, 3,992 degrees Fahrenheit. So is, like 4,000 4, degrees. 4,000 degrees. <laughs> boiling quartz. Yeah. It's definitely cook fires. Right. Just the cook fires. God, can you, I mean, like. So a lamelle. How is there anything left of this village? I know. The bones in the village, like the human and animal bones, had like embedded melt glass little oh my grains God. in. And and there were uh, some melt glass. I think this, they might get into this actually in a later paper. I'm just, I'm, they definitely do. Um, they imprinted on like the the vegetable or like plant materials. Oh. So, anyways, so uh, you think about that. Lamelle, real quick, uh, is a thin layer membrane or plate of tissue, especially in bone. Yeah, but this is in reference to. Uh, is that right? What did it say? Was lamelle? Because I didn't know that term. Maybe I'm reading it wrong. Uh, it, uh, L a m e l l a e. Yeah. Anyways, we'll encounter it again. Yeah. Yeah. This I site thought is this crazy. Was, Shock fractures are shock lamellae, so it must shock be lamellae. it must be a geological term or some term referring to um, thin yeah. layers of crystalline material. Okay, maybe? yeah, yeah. Okay. So yeah, you just think about that. If there's stuff embedded in their bones, it has to pass through all the stuff on top of the bones. The f the the flesh is vaporized, man. Boiling point of quartz. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, the f right? Yeah, I guess so. Maybe the flesh is already gone when his stuff is wild. hitting the bones. I mean, yeah. surely, yes, it's going to tear their flesh off or whatever, but... I, I know what you're saying. Like, yeah. it has to be... Yeah. <laughs> it's hard to imagine. <laughs> yeah. All right, we're going to take a break. We'll get to the other uh, three papers. Uh, yes. Next second. Certain podcasts, half our pyramids tied behind our backs just to make it square, ladies and gentlemen. That's an intro I haven't used in a long time. But uh, this padding thing, I, you know, I'm not really sure I agree with calling it a pyramid, but maybe that lowest structure is pyramid shaped. But I'm not sure the rest of it. And more is like a, it's, I don't know, like a, more like a ziggurat, maybe? Does Terrorist? pyramid mean it's like four sided? And I think, well, maybe not. It just, I means mean, fire and fire inside. inside. Okay. Yeah. All right. <laughs> Touche. <laughs> Legit point. But yeah, yeah I think when the... you normally say pyramid, people think of like a four sided. I know, but what's the... giant stone triangle? What does the name mean? Fire in the middle. Gunung Padang. Oh, uh, mountain of enlightenment. It's almost the same thing. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> it's also made out of a giant volcano. <laughs> That's so. right. That's the part where there's <laughs> there was fire inside of it. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, so real quick for the Abu Huraira Syria Part One paper, just want to say the authors again: Andrew Moore, uh, James Kennett, Malcolm LeCompte, Christopher Moore, a uh, bunch of names that we recognized: uh, Wendy Wolbach, Alan West, and many others. And I think we're going to move on to part two real quick. So I, I'll i just read the title of this, Abu Huraira, Syria, part two. Additional evidence supporting the catastrophic destruction of this prehistoric village by a cosmic airburst roughly 12,800 years ago. And if you read the abstract, you basically see that they're just, uh, in addition to uh, the shocked quartz, they're going through all the other evidence for uh, this, you know, like an impact event or not an impact, but an airburst event. Nano diamonds, cubic diamonds, uh, other crystals, silica rich and iron rich microspherules, melted chromite, quartz, silica zircon grains, plenty of proxies. Uh, 
So it does have a lot of details in it, but we want to move on to the part three paper, Abu Huraira, Syria, part three, Comet Airbursts Triggered major climate change 12,800 years ago that initiated the transition into agriculture. So this is this is interesting. Uh, also author Andrew Moore, James Kennett, William, P., uh, William Napier, Malcolm LeCompte, Christopher Moore, and Alan West. So the abstract for this one says, the study investigates the hypothesis that Earth collided with fragments of a disintegrating comet triggering the Younger Dryas climate change 12,800 years ago. This collision created environmental conditions at Abu Huraira, Syria, that favored the earliest known continuous cultivation of domestic type grains and legumes. Legumes. Legu yeah. Legumes. Legumes. <laughs> Along with animal management. Beans. Adding to the pre existing practice of hunting and gathering. The proposed airburst coincided with a significant decline in local populations which I think is understandable, and led to architectural reorganization of the village. These events immediately followed the deposition of the Younger Dryas boundary layer that contains peak concentrations of high-temperature melt glass, nanodiamonds, platinum, and iridium. These proxies provide evidence of a nearby low-altitude airburst by a comet-like fragment of a former centaur, one of many uh, greater than three or Let's see, is that greater than, yeah, greater than three kilometer, 300 kilometer wide bodies in unstable orbits between the giant planets. This large body is proposed to have undergone cascading disintegrations, thus producing the torrid complex containing Comet Enki and more than ni uh, approximately 90 asteroids with diameters of roughly 1.5 to 5 kilometers. Here we present substantial new quantitative evidence and interpretations supporting the hypothesis that. Comet fragments triggered near global shifts in climate 12,800 years ago, and one airburst destroyed the Abu Huraira village. This evidence implies a causative link between extraterrestrial airbursts, environmental change, and transformative shifts in human societies. So, can we all now guess why the people didn't want to publish this paper? <laughs> Maybe some of us could take a guess at why they didn't like that paragraph. Uh, so this article is at the third of a three-part series about the archaeological site at Abu Huraira. Part one concentrates on shock-fractured quartz as evidence of a local cosmic airburst. Part two focuses on impact-related high-temperature melt glass, nanodiamonds, microspherials, iridium, and platinum. And part three, this contribution proposes that multiple cosmic airbursts and impacts triggered the Younger Dryas climate change that, in turn, initiated the transition from hunting and gathering to cultivation as a crucial step to full-scale agriculture. So, what do you think about this concept? I mean, I know that they're following the science, right? The, this is basically the earliest evidence that we have of agriculture is right at this period. Mm-hmm. But just like I have this feeling that just like with structures, this is just because we haven't found it yet or it has been found and not properly recognized because it just doesn't seem it seems weird to me. Is it is it is a massive population decline due to catastrophic event events? How does that change you into agriculture? How do you decide that staying in one spot is easier or better than traveling around hunting and gathering when uh, previous to this period, at the end of the Younger Dryas, like, okay, so the end of the Younger Dryas, the Holocene begins, right? Well, and you basically have, it becomes warmer, right? And ma so maybe it's more conducive to farming, but it seems like when it's harder to farm, that also means it's there's le you're less likely to find, like, easy to, to locate food. I don't know. I, I have this problem in my head. Like, previous to the Younger Dryas, was it easier to find food by hunting and gathering? And so you didn't need to farm? Like, what, what exactly is it about the climate change that causes people to start farming? It seems like when, when, when the CO2 concentrations were very low before the, before the Younger Dryas, during the Ice Age, that farming would be uh, that that plants themselves would be more 
I don't know, that they would be scarce, that plants that produce fruit would be less easy to find, and so it would make more sense to try to grow them yourselves. But maybe it just wasn't possible. I don't know. It's, it's complicated. But in my head, I'm just like, I'm not sure that this makes sense. I understand. I understand where you're coming from. Now, I keep thinking of uh, Dr. Moore's presentation at the Cosmic Summit, which he, you know, I might get this some of this wrong, so I highly recommend you go, people out there. Maybe we can get him on the show as well. I would love to get him on the show. Yeah. You go out there and uh, watch the presentation from the Cosmic Summit. Uh, that he did. It was it was fascinating, absolutely fascinating. But one of the, one of the points was uh, that there were burials, like pit burials, underneath the houses of the structure. And he was talking about this. Oh yeah, I do remember seeing yeah, yeah. that. Yeah. So just in the idea of like a burial tradition forming, um, if you imagine you go through your 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 society goes through some crazy catastrophic event where you have like this mass die off of people. In this case, an entire village is basically wiped out. Yeah. Now, people that know about that village and that are that have family in that village may not have all been there. Most likely they weren't all there. Okay. At the time of the destruction, and some of them may have potentially escaped that destruction and then they come back to this site and like everybody that they know is dead yeah and so this could spark the sort of like uh memorial idea to memorialize the dead in a in a way or, or something like that and maybe you know start the burial traditions okay and and like you know societies and and cultures throughout history have their uh, ancestral graves mm -hmm. that they they are not leaving like they come back to that place oh, forever. I see. So this is like the, possibly the formation. It makes of, you want to stay there because yes, okay. this is your ancestral. This all of your ancestors are buried here, type of thing. Killed by, killed by the gods. Yeah, buried here. So they so they built their houses on top of the graves or vice versa. You know, it could have been that way. Maybe. Okay, so it it gives it makes you sentimental towards this place where this horrible catastrophe happened, and then you're more likely to just not want to go roaming around. You want to yeah. stay there. Yeah. And because you stay there, you end up building structures. You, you, well, yeah. You make you, fences. You're like, well, how do I you get build animals? structures? You trap animals. You yeah. start you you know you start this whole process. And now, and this was the other interesting thing. And Laura reminded me of this last night when we were looking at these papers that he. He had talked about this idea of once you switch to a farming or a an agricultural society, what what is it called, agrarian or something? Yeah. You can't go back to hunter gathering. You can't just like start farming and then like go hunter gather for a while and then go back to farming. <laughs> yeah. And as we have learned since 2016, <laughs> once you start farming. You are always farming. <laughs> yeah. It is. There's always more stuff to do. <laughs> and there's always more stuff to do than you can do. So, yeah. So once you cultivate crops or once you uh, start like animal husbandry and you, you have these, you cannot leave them. You yeah. can't abandon them. Right. They will all die. Mm -hmm. They will all get sick. They can't fend for themselves. You now have to take care of them. In order for or if them, you let them go, that yeah, if you let them all out, you have to start it's, over. It's yeah. it's you've yeah. So so that's kind of his point. But not only that, once you once you start that farming society, and then you have this sort of division of labor come out of that, where you're producing a lot more food than you can consume yourself. Because once you start doing it at scale, yeah, now the community gets involved in in taking care of that food, processing that food, uh, creating like like. Yeah, slaughtering so may, the animals and doing all this stuff. So if you so you may you may know how to raise the goats or whatever, and thus get milk and meat and 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 skins from the goats, but you don't know how to make bread yes, or any of the stuff that right. goes into that because your neighbor's doing all the wheat farming. But or not only that, the the child rearing changes, right? Like how many babies you can have changes, and so you're having more babies 
And then you and really can't leave. They need the sustenance <laughs> of that higher, like like that surplus of food. Yeah. So now the entire like fabric of the society is reliant on this thing. You can't just switch to hunter gathering without once again, like you lose a lot of people. Lose a lot of people. Yeah. Okay. So this is kind of one of the things he he really uh, pointed out in his presentation. It's like, you know, this yeah, gets going right. and it it doesn't stop. It just gro- it cha- you know it changes everything. Now you can still have people in the society that will go out, but the society itself is going to be centralized around. Yeah, this. those people will always come back. They come back. So you have your hunters, yeah, and your gatherers, but they're no longer nomadic. So that was that's pretty cool. I don't so know if that's this... I don't know if that's an answer to your question. Why, you know, I think I think maybe. Well, I love this idea the that, that the yes, right. That this idea that that now you are maybe you have a reason to be tied to this place because of this this horrible catastrophe took place, right? And yeah, I can see that. Yeah, but it seems to have happened. In a lot of places, it's not just Abu Huraira, right? It, it's like you you have this general shift, and I've always wondered, like, and I guess I just I haven't been able to articulate this well, but my questions are basically: Did they start farming? Okay, aside from the grave idea and the becoming attached to a certain spot idea, did they start farming when the Holocene began? Because that's when it became possible. That could be too. I mean, maybe implying that before that, because of the incredibly, like you know, the CO two is down to like one eighty ppm, whatever. Was that how low it was during? I mean, recently? All, in the in the late glacial maximum, at least like yeah. twenty five thousand years ago, whatever. It was really low, right? So uh, maybe I'm getting that wrong, but it, I would imagine that at one eighty, your farming is not going to be lucrative, right? You you're going to have very, very low yields. Yeah. You know, if you can grow tomato plants, the tomatoes are going to be tiny and hard. Like, you know what I'm saying? Like, you're not going to get... So is that why they didn't do it then? And only when... After we have all these air bursts and the climate changes and all this water melts and the whole planet shifts gears, then suddenly it's warmer. And now now suddenly agriculture becomes possible. And that's why it, also why it starts. Like, another maybe reason. Maybe it was actually restarting. Right. So previous to that, you can't farm... But also these the low CO two content, the cold nature and the tundra, the like the you know the fact that large parts of the world um, that we live in now that are green and great were just completely inaccessible or hostile to life. Mm-hmm. Now, granted, other areas that are now hostile to life, like the Sahara and other mm-hmm. places, were green and you could live there and and maybe you could find food and stuff. But I'm just I've just wondered about this like. Is the transition from hunter gathering to to agriculture something that was necessary? In other words, what dr- like mm-hmm. was there something driving people to do it? You know, and so I've wondered about this. Like, you lose a lot of people. Does farming is farming now easier and necessary because you don't have enough people to go hunt and gather? I don't know. I mean, it seems like it's easy to feed yourself. Maybe if you're hunting and gathering, you could find enough food to get by mm-hmm. by yourself. If you have a family. That's harder, but if you got a small group of people up to 90 or whatever, and you're moving around, right, then if you have a sort of organized structure where these guys are the hunters, these people know what plants we can eat, and so they're the ones gathering, okay. you can feed a small group of people, but you obviously can't feed an enormous population this way. Well, another another possibility would be that they noticed a, a massive reduction in the animal population that they used to hunt yes that was probably a huge source where they maybe didn't need to farm yes but then like so these, if a large all these part mega of their diet die the out meat. yeah and then they're like oh my god like all we have is we need to corral all these little animals and like breed them because right. they're dying out they're all spread out you're right i i have to this is what i'm saying like i have to reform these ideas because like, you know, i think hunter gatherers and i think i still think mostly a plant diet it's more likely that it was mostly a meat diet supplemented with whatever plants they could find if they weren't cultivating anything, right? You're not yeah. going to find an enormous... Like, you're going to find some mushrooms. <laughs> I'm just know. thinking of the Comanche, for example. Like, they were... You know, they had just millions of buffalo. It was yeah. like, ah, you need food? Right yeah. over there. Right. Million. Yeah, go million find a slow burgers. one. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 
Yeah, you're right. So it's gonna be it's gonna be mostly a meat diet supplemented by by very difficult to process wild plants. Yeah. Right. You're not gonna find grains that are easy to eat. Like they're gonna be hard and small. No, you just got one. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, just <laughs> one of them hanging out. Of <laughs> uh, yeah, just chewing on. I it mean, what you know? What about buffalo? like potatoes and and like I don't know what what do any of these plants look like before they were cultivated into these large, beautiful tubers. These you know, like was a potato yeah. just this tiny little nugget underground? Yeah, well, like plant? there's there's places here where you, you know there's like a natural onion. Like an in, like a little onion. That yeah, and you pull it out. And it's, little... this, it's this big. Yeah, yeah, yeah that's what so, I'm but saying. But you find places where, like, oh my gosh, there's a whole bunch of these. Right. And I so, can, like, I can make a, a cereal. Yeah, two for tomorrow <laughs> with you spend, all of these. You spend, <laughs> <laughs> you spend an hour there digging around, and you've got a bag full of onions. <laughs> yeah. And then, like in Turkey, you know, the people still and then they're go like, up. "Why are you crying?" <laughs> it's, I'm crying from joy, bro. <laughs> I found my breakfast. <laughs> I'm sorry. No, I got you. I just, I, I'm, I'm just thinking of like, yes, there would be, they would know, you know, all and of these places they what, would go. And, what was the thing with? Isn't there a plant here that they would, what, what is they? They'd cook it underground, and it was it had a century plant. Yeah, it's basically agave, huge. So it has a big root thing under there. Okay, and that's that's totally wild. Nobody's ever cultivated it. It's oh, got I, a, I, I, I don't know, but I, I know that they. They uh, like okay, century plants may be cultivated and brought here, but like yuccas and sotals, <laughs> um, they're they're like those, but they're they have that you know, but they're the fronds are like much smaller, little pointy, gr- real bright green bush that sticks up, and okay. underneath the ground is this ball, like pineapple size thing that that they would they would eat that. You dig that up and. Uh, Cook it in a fire, roast it, or whatever. Because I'm also thinking of the, you know, that there's a lot of interesting they make evidence. alcohol out of them. Yeah, there's there's a lot of interesting evidence from the plateau in South America. The what is it? The uh, is it the Altiplano down there, where there's all this evidence that someone a long time ago went to a great deal of effort to uh, make completely inedible or uh, poisonous or maybe. Uh, non-nutritious things into something that you could eat that weren't poisonous. By, like, hybridizing them or something? Hybridizing them, finding yeah. ways to process them. Yeah. Right? So it seems, seems like, like desperation. A, a similar shift. Yeah, because yeah. this this whole area seems to have undergone some kind of catastrophic event. The lake moves miles away. You know, mm. it, it suddenly is... I don't know if I can say suddenly because the evidence, the geological evidence implies this happened millions of years ago, but it's, it's at 12,000 feet. Yeah. You can't grow anything, and somebody went to a lot of effort to make it so that certain things around there that you could find around there could become food. Mm. So maybe they lost their animal population as well. You know, if your primary source of food is animals, and then the animals are all gone, then suddenly you're like, we have to eat plants, mm-hmm. but plants suck. <laughs> so maybe if we focus on the plants. Then we can make them not suck, and that's they, that's basically. Then they farming. become succulents. <laughs> yes. <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, yeah, I don't know. I, 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 your guess is as good as mine, but I mean, we could, you know, you can come up with scenarios where you could say, well, maybe this is what happened, but who knows? I, I also, I mean, I still like the idea that uh, perhaps. The knowledge was shared with them, like you know, Graham's yeah. kind of main point that he keeps going back to is that there you could have had many different societies. Some were hunter gatherer types with low technology, and there were other more advanced societies. And when that catastrophe struck, they had to seek shelter with the hunter gatherer communities because there was no way to. They they yeah. would have been like what what Doctor Moore was talking about. Like once you lose that farming society hunter gatherer society or, no the once you go into farming now that your oh you got system a division has of labor, been destroyed yeah. you're like i know a lot about one thing but that one thing is not enough to keep me alive yeah. so then you seek 
shelter with these hunter gatherer groups because they can keep you alive. Yeah. But then you can pass on some of your knowledge to them, like, oh wow, this plant's edible. Let me let me have that. I'll yeah. let me let me do this thing that I know to do. And you start <laughs> yeah. planting them. Yeah. Or teach them how to, you know, uh breed and hybridize animals and stuff like that. Yeah. Who knows? If you take this plant and you graft it onto this other plant. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> They'd be making fun of you the whole time. Like, <laughs> yeah. look at this like, guy. What what is he's he doing? cutting holes in making this thing. some fake tree. <laughs> <laughs> food doesn't grow on trees bro okay <laughs> all right well let's see what they say in the paper here uh the transition from hunter hunting and gathering to cultivation in agriculture is one of human history's most significant adaptations and yet its evolution remains a contentious issue in archaeology. We acknowledge this ongoing debate about the timing and nature of agricultural development and recognize that this development was nonlinear and gradual. Furthermore, we are cognizant of the emerging new paradigms for plant and animal domestication in Western Asia. Thus, the exact timing of full agricultural development remains to be determined. Even so, Abu Huraira offers a unique record across a critical time in the transition from hunting and gathering to early cultivation and herding. In Western Asia, most sites occupied by late Epipaleolithic hunter-gatherers are preserved at different locations from those occupied by Neolithic farmers, partly because their contrasting substance, uh, subsistence strategies had different ecological requirements. Thus, the transition from foraging to farming at most sites across the region has been difficult to document accurately and at high resolution. In contrast, so basically what they're saying there is hunter-gatherer people live in different areas than farmers. And so you don't have them in the same spot in most places, so the transition is difficult to uh, to pin down. To pin at, down. At, at, like with any high... Right. So they're <clears throat> saying, in contrast, the Abu Huraira site supported the adaptive strategies of hunter-gatherers before the YD onset, followed by early cultivation afterwards. So mm -hmm. people in the same place were able to hunt and gather... Hunt and gather and then do cultivation. The village occupants left an abundant and continuous record of seeds, legumes, and other foods. Although the edible food remains have, pre have been previously counted, recorded, and published, the lead author of this contribution, we offer here additional novel, informative, and more robust interpretations. This record is the basis for our quantitative analysis of human food remains and is crucial for understanding the changes in human adaptive strategies during this pivotal transition period. Furthermore, our data analyses revealed the climatic conditions that favored certain plant types used for food and allowed comparison with existing climatic records for this region. Uh, so let me see what they say in conclusion here, because I, I love this, this, this shift from uh, hunter-gathering to, to agriculture is fascinating. And I do think that there maybe there are hints that, you know, some people were passing knowledge down. I don't know. It seems crazy that all over the place this was being invented independently, like around the world, you know. Like so you can say, well, the the it's not totally independent, right? The but you could maybe you want to argue that what connects all these people that were not in contact with each other around the world to go from hunter gathering to uh, agriculture was a global climatic shift, so that's what connects them, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. But the other possibility is, like you said, knowledge dissemination from the survivors of a previous agricultural or advanced culture who probably knew at about these places. Yeah, especially if they had traveled and mapped the world, yeah. which there is some evidence they had done that as well. Okay, conclusions. Previous investigations at Abu Huraira in Syria reported that the Younger Dryas boundary stratum contains abundance peaks in high-temperature milk glass, nanodiamonds, magnetic spherules, carbon spherules, platinum, iridium, nickel, and chromium. This contribution builds on those investigations and presents an integrated suite of high-resolution quantitative data and novel interpretations for transitioning from hunting and gathering to hunting and cultivating at the Abu Huraira site. Our investigation reveals slow changes in site utilization by humans for centuries up until and just after the YD onset, punctuated by a significant abrupt change immediately at the YD onset. Thus, 
Our investigation provides substantial additional support for the hypothesis that a cometary airburst occurred close to Abu Huraira, proposed as the as one of many nearly simultaneous airbursts broadly distributed over five continents. We suggest that fragments producing these airbursts were derived from a disintegrating greater than 100 kilometer wide comet. This encounter is proposed to have triggered hemispheric younger dry as climate change. Locally, this abruptly and fundamentally changed the lifestyles of Abu Huraira villagers as reflected in the adoption of persistent selective cultivation of domestic type wild grains and legumes in initial control of wild animals leading to domestication. This change was a vital step in transitioning from exclusively hunting and gathering to a sustained agriculture and herding. So again, I think maybe the question's not being answered. What they're just saying is, here's what the data shows, mm -hmm. that this did happen. I've, but maybe some of my questions still stand. Like, But I love this idea that, like, so, that you threw in about what Dr. Moore was saying in his presentation, that maybe the uh, memorial nature of, of this horrible destruction that happened at Abu Huraira, which clearly for a long time before this was a place where people lived, whether they were nomadic, maybe they left and they came back to it like it was seasonal when they were still all hunter-gatherers. They mm -hmm. were not doing any agriculture. The Abu Huraira village was what, like a seasonal occupation? I yeah, mean, I, I don't remember what, what, it, what it was. But something, you know, so something destructive happens there. A lot of people die, and then some people come back. And then they sort of memorialize the whole event. They begin this burial practice of putting your ancestors below your the foundations of your house. I mean, technically, you could be, <clears throat> you could have a village, and still be a hunter gatherer society. You're not cultivating. You're not crops. nomadic. Yeah. Yeah. But suddenly they start cultivating stuff, and then they start, you know, and maybe it's dealing because with animals and yeah. And. Yeah, so again that 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 makes that begs the question like if the village was already somewhere that they stayed at mm -hmm. then them suddenly having reasons to stay there doesn't it Yeah, does, that's a good point. Yeah, I don't know. Yeah. I don't know. That's what I was saying. I I also need to go back and watch that presentation. Yeah. <laughs> uh But yeah, the idea that burial practices would 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 spur the idea of like staying in one place, yeah, and not leaving your ancestors. So it ends your nomadic lifestyle. Yeah. So if they were already staying in that place, and that's sort of a moot point, I guess. Yeah, yeah. All right, we moving on to the next paper. Yeah, yeah we want to get to this. So this is um, evidence for a large late Holocene strewn field in what is this, Kiowa, Kiowa County, Kansas, in the USA. This is by our good buddy, Dr. Kenneth Tankersley. <laughs> Almost had a jam session. Almost had a jam session with him. <laughs> Dang it. <laughs> um, so the abstract is the Brenham uh, Haviland Meteor Crater. I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing that right. Is just <clears throat> one of a plethora of impact features comprising a large... 800 hectare late Holocene age strewn field in Kiowa County, Kansas. More than 10,000 kilograms of palisites, a rare class of stony meteorite, have been recovered from impact features and the surface of the strewn field. Six AMS radiocarbon ages demonstrate that there is a 95.4% probability that the impact event occurred within a range of uh, 1,497 BCE to 419 BCE, and most likely between 754 BCE and 419 BCE. The impact event is well described in Pawnee oral histories and illustrated in petroglyphs near the strewn field. The age and geographic extent of the Kiowa County, Kansas strewn field increases our understanding of the frequency of cosmic impact events on Earth and their influence on people and cultural change, or culture change. <clears throat> uh, so in the introduction, it says, There is evidence that the Native Americans have 
transgenerational knowledge of past cosmic impact events that have been passed down through their oral histories and cultural traditions. The homeland of one Native American tribe, the Pawnee, is in the Great Plains of North America, including Kansas. The Pawnee are known for the accuracy of their astronomical knowledge. Pawnee oral histories tell of a time when the stars flew and fell upon the earth. The Pawnee recorded this cosmic event as images engraved on sandstone cliff faces and ledges. Archaeologists refer to the site as the star shelter. Petroglyphs in that shelter are interpreted as depicting stars falling from the sky and landing among the people and animals. The Pawnee used distinctive crosses to illustrate stars in the petroglyphs as well as on the star charts. Archaeologically, they date to the Plains Village culture period, cultural period, roughly 900 to uh, 1850 uh, Common Era. Which is weird. That's yes, way so, after the yes, event. Yes, so it's like, but what he's, he's saying, saying is, is like their were, oral histories, yeah. they had transgenerational knowledge yeah. from oral histories, and then way later, they carved these possibly... Is they, it possible that some of these carvings are much older? Maybe, maybe they are. That, that they, I mean, he's just saying, I don't, yeah. you know. Again, he says... Um, Archaeologically, they date to the Plains Village. So archaeologically probably means they're associated with lithics. Yeah. Uh, and maybe pottery or whatever else, you know, the, the things they might find in layers that have been clearly associated with certain time periods. Yeah. <clears throat> um, so let me share this. Uh, So this is a uh, Kiowa County. I don't know if I'm pronouncing that right, and I'm that not looking right at me. the watchers' corrections. <laughs> but yeah, here's some pictures of the petroglyph stars. <clears throat> Pretty cool. So there are human figures, and the stars falling among them. Wow. I find that to be very fascinating. That's awesome. So he goes on to say, Pawnee oral histories describe how they discovered the strewn field and collected the brightly colored meteorites for their sacred bundles. The Pawnee described finding a barren place where there were colorful turtle-shaped stones, some of which were so heavy that the people could not carry them. Today, palisites, a rare class of stony iron meteorite, are found near the star shelter, appearing turtle-shaped with brightly colored translucent green and yellow olivine crystals. An ancestral Pawnee Lodge site located near Grandview, Kansas, contained a palisite effigy painted as a box turtle carapace. It has been radiocarbon dated to between 1,325 and 1,450 CE, the same cultural period as the star shelter petroglyphs. The radiocarbon age for the Pawnee Lodge and the Star Shelter petroglyphs suggest that the cosmic impact event occurred in the Pawnee homeland of what is today Kiowa County, Kansas, during the late Holocene. So the area surrounding the Star Shelter was once an extensive plain consisting of near level to gently sloping upland uh, with loamy Aeolian soils. Now let's see, if should I keep going on this? Um... Yeah, so he's just describing the, the surrounding. Yeah. Um, okay, so here let's let's look at this. So uh, okay, so since the second half of the nineteenth century, this region has been used for cattle rangeland and plowed cropland. Ranch hands collected meteorites from a small depression they thought was a buffalo wallow, approximately twenty kilometers north of the star shelter petroglyphs. The ranch owners made a subsequent collection of meteorites from the area. On March 13th in 1890, uh, Francis Whitmore Cragen identified the specimens in the Kimberley collection as a rare form of stony iron meteorite known as palisite. Details of their discovery and the palisite's chemical and mineralogical composition were published in the Journal of Science later that year. In 1925, Harvey Harlow Ninager, a self-taught American meteorit meteoritists, <laughs> meteoriticist. 
a meteoriticist, meteoriticist, <laughs> meteoriticist <laughs> visited Kimberly Ranch. He believed the buffalo wallow was the uh, discernible rim of a cosmic impact feature. Nininger collected small oxidized meteoritic fragments along the rounded rim of the 11 by 17 meter depression. In 1926, the Kimberleys dug a hole in the depression and exposed a layer of palisites. Nininger and uh, Jesse Dade Figgins were permitted to conduct a more formal excavation of the depression under the auspices of the Colorado Museum of Natural History. They found a layer of palisites above a highly oxidized horizon. Uh, the oxidized horizon was created by the decomposition of palisites during seasonal water ponding in the impact feature. Uh. While chronometric data were not obtained from the excavation, it was determined that a large amount of time was not required to create the underlying iron stain stratum. And he has a diagram of this. <coughs> so anyway, uh, they ended up... I'll show some pictures here. They ended up... Uh, <laughs> driving this they got these permission from the farmers to drive this <laughs> Jeep, a giant triangle this, this giant triangle <laughs> GPR thing <laughs> looking for other holes like this because they so they're trying to determine what was the you know the what is the whole size of this impact site yeah cuz there's no large craters uh that's a magnetometer survey Let's see. Because that's what they would be using, right? They're oh, stony iron meteors. You want to use a magnet. That may be what it is, yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah, magnetometer, magnetometer survey. survey conducted in a gridded search pattern with a raster scan and 30 centimeter overlap of survey area. Nice. So he says, because the strewn field has been heavily plowed for more than 100 years, the surfaces of impact features have been totally obscured. Subsurface impact features detected with the magnetometer were hand excavated to expose the palisite bearing stratum, underlying oxidized horizon and overlying strata. A, a backhoe was used to excavate the larger and deeper impact features. Stratigraphic units were characterized using Munsell coil, uh, soil color, sedimentary structures, and particle size. AMS radiocarbon sample, samples were collected for chronometric dating. <clears throat> so I just find that it's just yeah, cool. This like they're great. finding all these little tiny impact craters. <laughs> <laughs> so I don't know. That's that's just awesome. I I am fascinated by this the fact that these Pawnee had these oral traditions. Yeah, and the, of the, the stars falling and then we're drawing pictures. I just I think it's so awesome. And the this the story is is a little haunting. Like they the stars fall and then they go the, towards it and they find this giant barren yes area full of these weird turtle shaped rocks yeah turtles man <laughs> it's turtles all the way down it's proof <clears throat> that it's turtles all the way down oh wow these are beautiful let's look at these so these are cut polished and acid etched palisites collected wow. from the impact feature sample wow sites that is beautiful i guess that's the um uh olivine or, yeah. Oh wait, that olivine and iron in there. That's amazing. That's olivine right there. The green. Yeah, the green. Yeah. That's beautiful. That is that is so cool. I want him to come in and tell us more about it. Yeah. So what's the <laughs> conclusion? <laughs> I'll get there. Let's see. Um, conclusion. <clears throat> the possibility that Native American populations recorded the fall of cosmic bodies has been made in the past, but evidence that connects such records to actual events is generally regarded as thin. The example discussed herein may be among the first cases of an actual Holocene impact site and event correlated with Pawnee oral histories and material culture, for example, the petroglyphs and artifacts. This study provides future investigators with the tools needed to follow up on similar Native American oral histories. They could provide an especially rich fount of information that opens the many cosmic impact features suspected of being Holocene cosmic impact events, but have not drawn attention due to their small and poorly defined impact features, rendering them unknown and uninvestigated. Although meteoriticists... <laughs> 
I like meteoriticists. Yeah, it's probably meteoriticists. <laughs> Consider Brenham Valen uh, the world's smallest meteor crater. It is just one of many impact features spread across a large 800-hectare late Holocene age strewn field in Keola County, Kansas. Six calibrated AMS radiocarbon ages demonstrate a 95.4% probability that the impact event occurred between the times we mentioned before, uh, say r- probably 419 to 754 BCE. The age of the palisite bearing deposits uh, is 994 CE and 1470 CE, which is consistent with the age of the transgenerational Pawnee oral histories and nearby petroglyphs. I don't understand that. I don't understand this part. <clears throat> if the impact happened at, let's say, 700 B.C., then how can the palisite bearing deposits be at 900 A.D.? I don't understand. Or am I reading this wrong? That is a really good question. I don't I, I don't get know. it. Unless he's saying that the deposits were made by the Pawnee, they dropped them there. Palisite bearing deposits. I thought those were the pits they were digging in. Palisite bearing deposits. That's I what know. I thought too. Okay, let's continue on. We don't know. At the time of the cosmic impact event, the Great Plains was sparsely populated compared to the <laughs> densely populated metro. Metropolises. 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 <laughs> Metropolises <laughs> of the 21st century. The 10,000 kilograms of palisites collected from the strewn field to date may represent a small fraction of the total meteorite mass which impacted the late Holocene surface. This prehistoric impact event on the Great Plains was likely powerful enough that if such an impact occurred today, it could destroy significant portions of nearby modern metropolitan areas and cause a significant loss of human life. Knowing the frequency of cosmic uh, impact events involving impactors greater than 15 meters is vital to disaster managers who develop plans to reduce the loss of human life during catastrophic events. Currently, there is a, a Darth? Darth of chronostratigraphic data for late Holocene Age impact events. But or more a dearth? Ex- a dearth? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> don't ask me, bro. <laughs> I'm not known for knowing the right Dr. Tankersley. <laughs> Where are you getting these words? <clears throat> uh, but more examples in the archaeological and geologic records are expected to be found. To be useful, these data must be obtained and interpreted through interdisciplinary investigations that include AMS radiocarbon dating of strata with cosmic impact event proxies. Dearth. Dearth. I looked it up, yeah. They will provide a greater understanding of the occurrence and frequency of past cosmic impact events and their influence on human societies in the Western Hemisphere and elsewhere in the world. Yeah, so it's very interesting. I I would like clarification on these dates. <coughs> no, I'd love to get him on. Oh, Watcher's checking out. Well, thanks, thanks for being man. There, Watcher. Yeah, we're done anyway. I think. Right. Yeah, he's saying it's Kiowa. Kiowa. What was I say? Kiowa. Okay. Kiowa. Kiowa. It was also a tribe of Indians. Mm. That name, I think. But yeah, that's that's great stuff. Yeah. So go go. I'll put links in the show notes yeah. for the journal for the papers. It's all great stuff. Uh, it's it's a terrible. It's like a crime against science that these guys can't get published. Um. Maybe one maybe one day we we need to have a show on the. You know this peer review process, like we could talk about it. Oh like, man. Um. Because I've I've followed arguments about it, and it's just very it's very interesting because you can see the positives for having this kind of system, but then there's also clear negatives, mm-hmm. right? And here's one of this is one of them, and I think that they were saying that in their introduction to the journal, right? Uh, it was either yeah. in the introduction to the journal or what George wrote on the cosmic oh, a little bit of both, yeah. It's like, you know, this is a good system, but it also has terrible problems. And it's becoming less and less. Uh, it's hindering. It's, it's working less and less progress for, in terms of science. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. This this was crazy that they they 
there there was an actual paper done that this is what they mentioned in their introduction to the first journal that uh, the number of science and technology research papers published has skyrocketed over the past few decades, but the proportion of publications that send a field in a new direction has plummeted. Yeah, and so you so can, that's the gatekeepers. I can, I can hear skirptards making the argument that that's good. You know, that we've already got basically everything figured out, and we just need to work out the details, and there aren't new directions that fields need to go in. The direction they're going in is the correct one. Those people love boring. <laughs> they do. They love this boring. This is why I, I felt vindicated when I read that sentence. Yeah. I've been, like, complaining about boring articles for yeah. a long time, and I feel like, you know, there was the question, is this just, just me? Or... Is my news feed actually a lot more boring than it used to be? Like it feels it is. like, yeah, yeah. But then occasionally, you know, I mean, obviously this is something completely new in 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 a, in a direction to try to counter that. But like, this is interesting. And yes, and it's proven by how some of their papers have, like the uh, the first Abu Huraira paper or whatever, or the Tell Tell Al Hamam paper had like all, half a million people read it. Yeah. Now, you could argue that, you know, because it was connected with some biblical stuff that a bunch of people who normally don't read papers would go and read it because, you know, like there's a ton of people who are familiar with this story who mm -hmm. might be like, wait, science is showing me, uh, yeah, tell me that the Bible is God true. destroyed this city. <laughs> 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 but still, it's like this is good for science. It's good yeah. for science for for people who have never looked at a scientific paper in their lives to go and encounter one because they're interested in its subject. Like, they seek it out themselves, right? And then they read through the whole thing, and then you just, like, you see, oh, okay, you start to see the structure, and you see how much work they put into it and all this data, you know? And maybe you're trying to read it for vindication of some of some idea that you have, or maybe you're trying to read it hoping to find an error. But it works both ways. Like, like I, <clears throat> I, don't, I know, maybe I'm I'm just trying to say that, like, Having papers that get read by a large number of non-scientific people is a good thing. Yeah. And I have heard people say that, like, you know, that 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 one of the problems with a lot of these journals is they're behind a paywall, you know? Yeah. And a lot of times they, the other scientists don't even read the papers. They're looking for references when they're writing a paper themselves, you know? And then a lot of times, not not all the time, I don't know how frequently this happens, but... You'll get a reference where it's pointing you to some other paper, and then when you go read that paper, you're like, wait, this doesn't seem to be saying what they're implying that it says in this other paper. What is the value of anonymity in a review? I don't find there's any value in that. Now, I know that like certain scientists have like all this you know, clout that everybody's just like, oh, my God, they're so amazing. So you're yeah. like some little guy you know, that's on the review group, and you're like, man. He really messed up this paper. <laughs> and you don't want to do it because you don't want to like lose your career or something because of a bad review. Yeah, but isn't it usually the opposite? The big journals want the, oh my God, he's an amazing yeah. scientist as a reviewer. Yeah, but my so so my point is is like it should be more like the 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 like the court system where you're you're not anonymous, you're a juror. Yeah. Yeah, you need to. You, yes, it's that, and it is supposed to be like a jury of your peers. Yeah, a it's jury peer of your peers. review. All right, that's what it's supposed to be. But these, I guess juries are anonymous, like what? But I mean, they're either unanimous or you're not guilty. Right? right. <laughs> yeah, you got a hung jury, <laughs> and nobody knows who was that one guy that said not guilty. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I just don't find any. I think I think people should put their names on it if they if they think it's a great article or a bad article well i think tell me why i think that what th this may just take a while but i think what is going to happen because i just don't i just don't see that there's going to be any kind of massive reform of the peer review process right yeah so what it seems more likely to me to happen is that there will be alternatives there already are you know uh there's plenty of pl places where people on can just publish a paper into a non- Peer review, a journal that just lets you publish, you know. Now that 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 means that like it isn't, it doesn't have the clout. It's called like, isn't that pre-published or something like that? They're publishing it, but it's not been peer reviewed. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And you can just post it on places, yeah. you know. I think isn't. I don't want to. I don't want to list off any. I don't know for sure, yeah. but there are places where you can put papers, and you can go find papers, and then you can like judge for yourself. 
That's the thing. And then people are just like, well, I don't have time to comb through all this data. Well, are you saying that the that the that the amount of data that's out there needs to be completely curated by anonymous people? And that only the curated information from all these anonymous people is going to be accepted as good science? Is that a good system? I, yeah. I don't know. So I don't, I don't think it is. I mean, people have been debating this. People that are way smarter than us that have been debating this yeah. for a while. <laughs> it's like, I don't have any answers. <laughs> but it seems to me like the system will just, it's just going to be a shift that will happen gradually. And this is, this is part of the shift. So like from, there's two ways to look at it. From like a consumer, like a science consumer type of position where we're interested in following this stuff. We're not a peer. We're not peers of the scientific community. Yeah. From out here, it looks bad, right? Like, whatever's going on. It doesn't look... You mean in the peer review process. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And so, like, the system that I'm thinking of is like, well, these guys should be like Martin Sweatman and just, you know, get on YouTube and just do a review. Yeah. And point out where the bad science is and stuff like that. But he, But Martin Sweatman was doing that more for... Uh, the general public. Yeah. Whereas the peer review process is also for the peers. It's not really. Yeah. So like if if you're if you write a paper and you want to publish it, you send it to your peers. Your peers review it. Other of your peers can see what the review was. Yeah. They can read the reviews or whatever. And. It's. I think it's an informative process because you're like, oh well, maybe we did make a mistake right there. Yeah, that's that doesn't make any sense. Like, yeah, maybe we made a mistake on the way we analyzed this data, and then you go back and you fix it because it's kind of what they were pointing out. Like, this is what we want. Yeah, maybe to we want a constructive review process that rather seems, than rather than a so, than, than an on off. So right? that's what I'm saying. From, it seems like the process <clears throat> really needs to be created by those guys for them. Because they they need the constructive criticism from their peers to show them where they may have made mistakes. Yeah, it shouldn't be an agenda driven or a bias driven process. But how do you you know how do you filter that? Yeah, out? how are you gonna fix that? Agendas and biases everywhere. You know. Yeah. Don't know how to fix it. Definitely know how to trash things that are not good. Though. <laughs> <laughs> I have a bias. I have to admit, if I was a scientific paper reviewer, an anonymous one, and a paper came in and was like proof that there was an incredibly ancient civilization, I'd be like, passed. <laughs> Put it in the paper. Put it in the journal. Good science. Don't even need to read it. <laughs> right? That's bias. <laughs> yeah. No, I, you know, what you, what you have to do is you have to be like, I really want... Yeah, <laughs> this paper to be true, but it's not. It's definitely not true. <laughs> yeah, I would love it <laughs> if this was true. <laughs> yeah. All right, folks, we, yeah. we're gone over. Man, that middle segment just looks puny compared to the first. One <laughs> it does. It does. Well, I hope you all enjoyed that. I did. Yeah, uh, that was fun. Really good articles and. Uh, are yeah, we doing a Patreon? For, looking forward to more stuff coming out. I'm down. Okay, let's do it. I got three cold ones in the little cooler right now. <laughs> it's, not, it's not about how many beers you it have. It's absolutely. about whether or not you have anything to talk about. <laughs> <laughs> Give me a few more beers. I have some to talk about. <laughs> okay. All, All right. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Check, check the show notes again. Go check the journal. Click on the papers. Read the abstracts. Look through the data. It's great stuff. We really... Uh, uh, we really support these guys at the, at the uh, Comet Research Group for doing this. And thanks to George for uh, pointing us towards it yeah. and getting us all aimed in this direction and helping out. And uh, we yeah, also... Yeah, he's, he's been a great advocate for these guys. Yeah. I mean, introduced us to them and yeah, so there are others. There will be links to uh, the Cosmic Tusk in there as well, as well as the paper for Gunung Paddock. And link to the Cosmic... Comic, uh, comic Cosmic research. Summit. Cosmic Research... Why can't I think of this? CRG.org. Yeah, Cosmic because we're, we actually uh, yeah, we support them as well. We're patrons of that site. They need support. They fund a lot of this research on their own. 
mm-hmm. and with donations. So we donate every month. Yeah. So help them out if you can. Yeah. And uh, all right, we're gonna we're gonna roll out another Patreon episode. So uh, thank you guys very much. We love you. Always have. Always will. Good night, Adamu. Get back to work. Thank you.